The story begins with a view of a large estate. Outside blossoms are blooming and birds are chirping. Inside the manor, Ash Widgreen, the oldest son of the Woodgreen family, is lying on the couch reading a book. He informs his sister that her birthday is around the corner and asks if she needs or wants something special. After thinking for a moment, the girl replies that she doesn't wish for anything. As it turns out, this is the oldest daughter of the Widgreen family, Lydia Widgreen. Sneaking away from her younger brother, Ash, she burns fan letters. Upon hearing that her sister wants nothing, Ash replies that this is always the case and Lydia doesn't even really like dolls. Forcing out a laugh, the girl thinks she's lying to Ash, saying she doesn't want anything. The only thing she wants with all her heart is to avoid death at the hands of her brother. She must survive. Lydia adds that after her birthday, Ash's birthday will soon follow. When he turns 18, he will be an adult, to which her brother agrees. The girl sinks back into her thoughts. The day they celebrate Ash's birthday and his coming of age will be the same day the main character shows up and it will be the day of her escape. Lydia imagines her running away from home, saying she is the winner here. Lydia was a university student living in Seoul. She recalls being yelled at by a certain guy, asking if she was laughing at him. Remembering how she stood in front of him, the girl thinks that if she hadn't met that psycho, her life wouldn't have ended like that. Scared then, Lydia rushed to run away from the guy. She can't believe this happened to her. The girl was hit by a car after running out into the road. She asks herself why she is so unlucky. Then the girl thought she was dead. The action shifts to another time. A maid approaches the crib and asks if the lady is awake yet. A girl reborn in this world. After dying because of that psycho, she got another chance. Lydia is reborn in a fantasy novel world. There is a monarch and nobles and even magic. But the most important girl is believed to have been born not just with a golden spoon in her mouth, but with a diamond spoon in her mouth. All her life she has walked the red carpet and she just had to keep walking down it and live happily ever after. Growing up, Lydia says her past life was torture and she pulled out the golden ticket. But her happiness didn't last long. One night, walking down the hallway, a sleepy Lydia says she's passing out. She passes a door where she hears her parents' voices and looks in. They inform her that Lydia will be upset when she finds out, but the girl doesn't understand what she should be upset about. The parents say that they have always raised Lydia as their own daughter, and the girl realises that she is adopted. The Duke's wife was told that she was infertile, which they believed and adopted Lydia, but the doctor turned out to be a fraud. When Lydia found out, the Duchess was already in her position and her baby brother was on his way. The girl thinks her days are numbered. From that moment on, the girl is always upset, thinking she'll never have a diamond spoon in her mouth. She wonders if she will be thrown out when her brother is born and if she is thrown out, if she will be allowed to pack her things. When asked by the maid if the girl is ill, she replies in the negative. She doesn't know where she can get money. Lydia doesn't know what to take with her, but she has time to realise what valuable things she has in her room. She is constantly stressed, because she doesn't know when she will be kicked out, and constantly asks herself if she will be kicked out today. Even while eating breakfast, she ponders whether she'll be kicked out in a day or two, or today. But so it's been seven years, and she still hasn't been kicked out. The girl wakes up on her birthday, saying she is too emotional, and asking herself if she's going to be kicked out or not. Her brother Ash is even running well, but she doesn't know why they haven't kicked her out yet, or if they've changed their minds. As she gets out of bed and puts on her slippers, she decides she's really lucky. Ash knocks on the door. Lydia runs up to her brother and asks him what's wrong. Ash replies that it's his little sister's birthday, he carries a large bag behind his back, saying it's a present for her. Lydia thanks her brother, not realising when he had time to prepare it. When the sack is untied, the girl is horrified to see her bound maid, Melissa. She asks her brother what it is, and he replies that it is a doll. He was looking for a doll like the one the girl broke, but was told it had been discontinued. He reports that he thought it was wrong, and made his sister such a gift. Ash wonders if Lydia likes the gift but the girl doesn't understand what he's carrying. The doll the girl had did look realistic, but it was just a doll. Ash dressed up the maid exactly like the doll and brought it to Lydia, but their maid is a living person. Lydia calls Ash a psychopath, asking if that's too much. 
She doesn't understand how a seven-year-old can't tell the difference between a doll and a living person. Lydia pats her brother on the head, telling him to let the maid go immediately, to which Ash asks, with his hand on his head, if Lydia is angry and didn't like it. Lydia replies that she can't help but be angry seeing such a thing. She shouts to her brother to stand against the wall and raise his hands, for he does not understand her words. As she unties the maid, Lydia suggests that her brother may have some kind of mental problem. She tells Ash not to do that again, to which he sulks. Lydia decides that he understands her and it's no big deal. She seems to have to teach him. Not much time passes. Lydia is sitting in a gazebo outside and is called by Ash. The girl asks her brother what's wrong, but he replies that the past doll didn't like his sister. He lifts the bound boy up by his hair, showing him to Lydia, and wonders if she likes the doll. The girl doesn't realise he's carrying again. She thinks Ash thought she got mad last time because she didn't like that doll. Lydia decides that her brother is definitely a psychopath. She yells at her brother, Asking if he's crazy, she has no way of knowing. After punishing her brother again, she tells him to untie the guy, which he does, pouting. The girl decides that Ash thinks it's all a game. She thinks that everything other than family, people, animals, things, are just toys to him. She thinks he should be punished harder next time. She was naive because there were bigger problems ahead. The action shifts to the future. Lydia is on the floor of the room, shocked, and in front of her lies a book. Looking at it, the girl realises with horror that she is in a novel. This novel is Spring of the Diviner Greta, and its plot is set in this world. She herself and many other characters exist in this novel. Lydia further reads the book, and reads that her brother Ash Widgreen is the villain, and she herself is a minor character, Lydia Widgreen. Not believing this, the girl thinks it's all a bad joke. Maybe the author used real names, or maybe it's just a coincidence. Lydia turns to Bessie, who is washing the windows. The maid doesn't understand what's wrong. The girl, jabbing the book right in Bessie's face, asks what is written in it. Bessie, touching the book, replies that the book is just blank pages, which leaves Lydia shocked. Bessie wouldn't lie to Lydia. The girl doesn't realise if she has lost her mind. Reading the book again, Lydia can't believe it. Everything that has happened in the last couple of days is described to the smallest detail in the novel, this is definitely the world from the novel. Even if she went crazy, she wouldn't be able to predict the future. The girl assumes that she got this privilege because she remembers her past life, but that's not the main problem. Because if the plot of this read is to be believed, she will be killed again. She can't believe she's going to die again. In the plot of the novel, her parents will die two years later due to a serious illness, and the fact that Lydia was adopted will come to light. Lydia presents what is written in the book. She lies before her brother, who says she doesn't have a drop of his blood in her, and asks if she dares to tell him what to do, whereupon he draws his sword and pierces his sister with it. The girl will be killed by her brother. Ash is smart and strong and will inherit the title. Lydia has accepted the mystery of her birth, but the fact that her brother is a psychopath is something she can't accept. He will destroy everything in his path, which infuriates him but even such a monster can fall in love. And it will be the protagonist, a greeter. Ash will fall in love with her at first sight, destroying people around her. The day of the girl's death is fast approaching. She realises that she shouldn't have hit him, regretting it. She didn't need to punish him and should have treated him kindly and sweetly, but now he will kill her. Morning comes. After spending all night reading a book, the girl has decided she just needs to escape, but she can't run away right now. If he catches her red-handed, he'll go berserk and probably kill her even sooner. Lying on the floor, Lydia thinks that according to the plot, Ash will fall in love with the main character at first sight, and then stop caring about her. But the girl escapes and saves her life. Now she has to think of what to steal from her house. But before she can do that, she must do one more thing. Prevent the death of her parents. The girl thinks they say if you ask desperately for something, heaven will hear the pleas. And then Lydia asks for heaven to hear her. But time passes, and Lydia's parents die of illness. A funeral takes place. The master of ceremonies reads a book, saying that Vingrida's spouses will find eternal rest. The girl, weeping, thinks that she cannot seem to change the future at the Pike's command. 
Ash, who is standing nearby, pulls her into a black suit and takes her hand, telling her that it's just the two of them now. Lydia agrees that it's just the two of them, the secondary character and the antagonist, who slaps the secondary character. Unable to hold back her tears, the girl thinks she messed up, and her brother asks if her sister is crying. Even though the girl knew everything, her parents' death has shattered her and her escape plan isn't going as easily as she thought. Lydia didn't notice how time flew by at a breakneck speed. The action shifts to the present. All the courtiers are preparing for some sort of celebration. Lydia asks if the invitations have been sent out and says that she will check to make sure nothing has been lost and orders her subordinates to make sure that tomorrow's dinner is on point. The girl turns to Alex and tells him to go to the basement and check the list to make sure nothing is missing. As evening falls, Lydia is once again sitting in the gazebo drinking tea, the mug trembling in her hands. She mentally orders herself to calm down, but she is under evening stress. Tomorrow will be the day, the fateful meeting of the main character and the villain, and his gaze will be turned only on her, and thanks to this, the secondary character, that is Lydia, will be able to escape. Picturing her escape in her head, the girl decides it's the perfect plan. The heroine needs to run away during the banquet as soon as Agrita shows up. Drinking tea, she thinks that when Ash falls in love with Agrita, she needs to get away. He will remove all the people around her because they will piss him off like flies. And if she misses this chance, she will go to the afterlife again. Lydia is suddenly approached by Ash and she's shocked. Ash sits down at his sister's table and Bessie says that brother and sister always look happy when they are together. The girl thinks she's heard this so often that she doesn't pay attention anymore and squeezes out a laugh. Suddenly, Ash declares that he would like to go to the chapel tomorrow and wonders if his sister will go with him. Lydia is surprised by this and asks if she needs to go to the square with him. Ash answers in the affirmative. Lydia had once mentioned that she wanted to go there. As she sips her tea, the girl wonders if she really said that and doesn't understand how Ash remembers such a small thing. She thinks her answer is unequivocally no, for she's running away. Lydia answers her brother in the negative, saying she's already seen the chapel. It's already so old there's nothing to see there. Her brother wonders if this is true, Lydia replies positively, but thinks it's a stupid excuse. She wonders if the chapel should be torn down and rebuilt. Ash, listening to his sister, decides that's what should be done since his sister says so. Lydia realises she shouldn't have said that. She did a damn crazy thing and soon realised everything. As time passes, Lydia sits at the table in her manor house drinking tea. Ash comes to her and tells her that he has done what she asked, but she wonders what he did. Ash replies that today is exactly what he did. He destroyed the chapel. Lydia is shocked and comprehends what Ash has done. She asks if Ash destroyed the chapel in the square, to which he replies in the affirmative. The girl thinks that anyone who overhears their conversation will think it's about an ordinary castle. She asks her brother why he did it and asks if he knows it's crazy. Ash replies that it should have been done before, holding out a tray of cookies to his sister. Lydia thinks her brother is definitely a psychopath and doesn't realise if she said anything about the chapel yesterday. Anyone else would think it was just a joke, but her brother isn't joking. He's sincere about everything. Snickering, the heroine thinks her psychopathic, villainous younger brother didn't even think about the human cost. She covered up the chapel for her own purposes, and people ended up getting hurt. The girl apologises to the victims, hoping they are in a better place. Suddenly, the girl realises something and turns to her brother. She asks when exactly he tore down the chapel, and the brother calmly replies that he tore it down in the morning. Lydia rushes away from the room, leaving her brother bewildered. She runs up to a servant carrying towels and yells that she needs a list of the chapel victims immediately. The servant rushes to fetch the list. The girl can't believe it and thinks she's just screwing herself up. Ash, approaching her sister, asks what happened. The girl realises that this morning the protagonist of the novel Agrita climbed the chapel because today is a charity event and she needs to pray that everything goes without incident but she can't understand how her evil little brother destroyed the chapel early in the morning. Lydia thinks she gave an errand to a servant because she doesn't really know if the main character, Agrita, is on the lists or not, but she thinks she isn't because it's nothing, because Agrita is the main character of this world. 
Suddenly, the girl is called by a servant who says he has brought what she asked for. Lydia takes the list, thanks to the subordinate. As she reads the list, she realises that the losses were not as great as she thought. Suddenly, the heroine sees Agrita Grace, who died in the destruction of the chapel, on the list, which comes as a shock. She realises that the protagonist of this world is dead, dropping the list on the floor and can't believe how it happened. Ash notices his sister's slump and asks what happened, but Lydia still doesn't understand how Agrita could have died. Ash hears what his sister said and interjects. The girl looks at her brother and realises that this is just crazy. Her crazy brother finishes off the main character. She decides he really is crazy. Lydia calls her brother crazy and asks in her mind if he knows who he killed. Suddenly, the girl rushes away. Ash, holding the list in his hands, doesn't realise what's wrong with his sister. Lydia thinks there is only one way to fix this. She unlocks the door of her room and thinks that she wanted to use this method if she couldn't escape and thought to save it until the very end. She pulls out a drawer from her bed, hoping it says it all. In the drawer lies a mysterious box. When she realised her end was dire, she made every effort to survive at all costs. The box contains mysterious stones. According to the novel's plot, they must belong to Agrita. There were originally three gods in this world, the god of destruction, the god of time and the goddess of love. Each god had its own temples, but ten years ago one oracle appeared in all the temples. On the day when the full moon illuminates the lowest place on earth, the goddess will appear in this world, watching over and caring for all things on earth. Opinions were then divided on the interpretation of the prophecy when the question arose as to what it meant though they concluded that it was necessary to calculate the time of the brightest full moon, so that they could then say that all was not what it seemed. The oracles agreed that the full moon had nothing to do with the real moon. The prince of the empire was then nicknamed Young Sun. The crown prince went undercover to understand the public unrest. In a cold and lonely street, he met a poor child, and quite by chance they ran into Agrita, who would later become the crown princess. The oracle stated that she was destined to be an empress. Agrita, who became empress, would be honoured as a goddess from the prophecy for her beneficence. Even the temple and priests will recognise her as a goddess, but that will be in the future. Sitting in front of the box, Lydia thinks that the temple doesn't know the truth yet. But there is already a clamour to welcome the goddess who will descend to earth. In her box is the Trihaya, an artefact made by the temple in honour of the god of time. These are stones that can turn back time when broken. Taking one stone in her hands, the girl thinks they are made as a gift for the goddess, and it takes a whole ten years to make thirty such stones. It turns out that Lydia stole them. She only managed to steal fifteen, and if the temple had caught her, they would have strung her up or tried to kill her in other ways. She thinks stealing only half of the stones was an act of conscience. The joyful girl thinks she will save Agrita with this, and asks herself if she can be called a thief for such a noble purpose. Now she can rewind time and save the protagonist of this world. Lydia thinks about it. The more she thinks about it, the more unbelievable it all seems. She doesn't understand how her brother could have killed Agrita, but if it wasn't related to Ash, she wouldn't have done anything. Her rage is at an all-time high and she feels like scolding her brother. She orders herself to come to her senses she just needs to smash the stone, for the success of her escape directly depends on Agrita's life. The broken stone will instantly turn back time by exactly one day, and she will still be back in time. Lydia comes out of her room, holding one stone and calling out to her brother. Ash and the servant who had been communicating with the prince don't understand what has happened. Lydia, walking straight to her brother, thinks Ash has grown up during this time. She doesn't want to die prematurely. She's been slacking off the whole time, not saying what's on her mind. Gaining air, the girl screams at her brother, calling him a crazy creep and asking how you can throw away other people's lives. She doesn't want Ash to live as a villain. The heroine swings and throws the artefact against the floor, which shatters with a clang. Lydia is blinded by the light. She hears Bessie speaking to her and comes to her senses. She finds herself on the balcony, with Bessie standing next to her. The maid informs her that she has brought the shawl the girl asked for, for it is very cold outside. Taking the shawl from Bessie, the girl wonders if she is back to yesterday. 
She remembers sitting on the balcony yesterday and asking Bessie to bring her the shawl. The girl realises that she has indeed gone back a day and almost falls off her chair. Bessie anxiously asks if Lydia is ill, but she replies that she is fine, just a little weak in the legs. She tells Bessie that she wants to be alone, which makes the maid worried and asks again if the girl is all right, to which she replies in the affirmative. Bessie tells Lydia to call her if she needs anything and leaves. Lydia covers her face with her hands and comes to think. Her brother has grown up. Morals and common sense are foreign to him, though she was careful in her actions. She chastises herself for yelling at her brother, but decides it was a hell of a thing to do. The moment of opening her soul is priceless, and stealing the stones was her best decision. She feels like the pain in her heart is gone. Lydia remembers the stones and goes to her room. She pulls the cupboard out from under her bed again and counts the stones. She has exactly 14 left, for she has used one. The girl looks out of the room and calls out to the maid, asking her to come to her. She asks the maid what day it is, and she replies that it is September 13th. Lydia realises that this is correct, and that it is yesterday's date. She decides that these stones are very useful, and tells the maid that she is a little confused, and she can go. As she closes her room, the heroine thinks that Agrita, who used this power for the sake of others, is incredible, which is why she was dubbed divine. If Lydia had such powers, she would discover many bad things about herself. Agrita used these stones for the sake of saving others without malice. But the girl convinces herself that she is doing good, after all. She is saving Agrita. She decides that she should stop getting herself worked up and needs to save the chapel. But the girl thinks the main problem is Ash, but there's nothing she can do about him. She notices that it is about noon and her brother wanted to be in chapel the next evening. She decides it's better to go to him now, but this is the kind of time Ash works and is free closer to evening, and only he can come up with crazy decisions in an instant. Lying on the bed, Lydia thinks Ash is a real evil psychopath. She thinks she needs to stop flapping her tongue about things like tearing down the chapel. She needs to always keep in mind that she's communicating with Ash. But the girl doesn't know what to do how she can refuse to go with her brother to the chapel and not destroy it. Lydia decides she needs to quickly come up with a plausible and safe rejection for her. The action is postponed until the evening. The girl went down to the living room for a cup of tea. Not a good excuse had come to her mind the whole time. But Lydia doesn't look nervous. She laughingly informs me that she has thought of something else. If you can't say no, don't say no, Lydia thought again. This day she was sitting in the garden and Ash happened to find her. And when they met, he talked about the chapel. She thinks the best way to reject an offer is to not accept it at all. In other words, the girl just doesn't need to catch Ash's eye. And so she changed the garden to the living room. Her brother is busy and won't be out of the study for the next hour. She'll be gone before then. She decided that she would just retire to her room and not come out until tomorrow. She has nothing to worry about. The girl had already decided that the protagonist would never die when Ash appears at the door. He calls out to his sister, which startles her. Ash comes closer to her and asks if she's okay. Ash comes closer to her and asks if she's okay. Lydia doesn't understand why her brother is here at all. She doesn't understand if events can be different when you go back in time. Then Bessie comes into the room, who sees Ash and says he's already downstairs. She also tells him she just sent Alex. She replies that she is very worried about the lady today, as she didn't respond when she called for her, just blinked at the wall and sighed. Bessie thought Ash should know about it and sent Alex after him. Alex opened his mouth and the Duke immediately came down. Covering her mouth with the palm of her hand, Bessie says that Lydia was too dangling in her thoughts today. The girl goes into shock. Ash replies that if he had known about this earlier, he would have come down immediately and asks his sister again how she is. Lydia replies that she's fine. She wonders if Ash will invite her to chapel tomorrow. If he does, she doesn't know how to refuse. She thinks she might play dumb and get the wrong idea. Suddenly, Lydia falls into Ash's arms and pretends to be sick and not feeling well. Ash grabs her sister and asks if she's okay. But the girl is shocked that her brother is so strong and has grown so much, admiring him in between. She wonders if it was her curses that did it. Ash wonders where Lydia's pain is. The girl thinks that if she says something wrong, 
her brother might realise that she is lying, so she decides that she will not say anything to Ash. She replies that her strength has left her and her body feels like absorbent cotton. She has no appetite. She says she just doesn't have any strength, but feels a strange feeling looking at her brother. Lydia thinks Ash used to be so short and chase her tail, and now he's grown up a lot. She thinks her brother was so cute it's too easy to call him handsome. He looks like a marvellous doll by the best craftsman. This is where Ash asks his sister if she's been going out less and less lately. He says that he has been very busy lately and suggests that she go to the square tomorrow because she wanted to see the chapel. Lydia realises she's ruined everything. Ash adds that he has some free time tomorrow before dinner. Here the girl pretends to cough, thinking she has to excuse herself. But then her brother demands that a doctor be called. He doesn't understand how the doctor dared not look after his sister's health. He's the family doctor and if he can't do his job, he can't get away with it. Lydia realises that this is already a dangerous reaction. She quickly says it's no big deal, because she's coughing because of the dust and it's already cold. She's been drinking special meds and they're just strong for her. She realises that if she sets the doctor up, nine times out of ten, Ash will bark him. She remembers that the doctor is a father of three. Suddenly, Ash looks at his sister and touches her forehead with his hand then gives the verdict that she has no fever. The girl asks if this is a normal reaction, and Ash replies that they need to get out as early as possible tomorrow and eat. Lydia realises that she cannot avoid it. She presents the chapel in front of her and asks her why it is even needed in the square, since it just stands there and causes one trouble. Bessie, standing nearby, keeps her eyes on Ash and Lydia, and this girl notices and wonders what's wrong with her. The maid replies that brother and sister look good together. The action moves to evening, and a strong wind has risen outside. Come the next day, Lydia realises that it's all sad that it all happened this way, but nothing is lost yet. Her primary goal is to prevent Agrita's death. If the tower is not destroyed, the protagonist of this novel will not die. Dressing up in front of the mirror, the girl thinks that even if a knife is held to her throat, she will not say that the chapel is an old thing worth tearing down. Putting on her gloves, she tells herself that even if she is stabbed with a blade, she will not say so. She is going to praise the chapel as best she can. As hard as she can, she must avoid seeing Agrita. She and Ash will just see the chapel and go home. After dressing up, Lydia walks out into the main hall, where she is met by Bessie and another employee. Bessie admires the girl's outfit, saying that Lydia looks beautiful. The girl thinks that every time she dresses up, She's compared to a blooming rose, and she likes that comparison. She likes it because roses have thorns, and it's her fighting form for Ash. It's the first thing that came to her mind. It's her first tactical step to successfully escaping from Ash. Lydia thinks to herself that it's really been a while since she's been out in public. This is when Bessie asks the Duke if he's ready. Lydia turns around and sees her brother behind her, who is dressed nicely for the walk. The girl thinks he looks like her executioner, but he still looks amazing. Bessie and Alex only admire the Duke's look. As he walks up to his sister, he politely holds out his hand for her to take and wonders if she's ready. Lydia is embarrassed looking at the guy and grabs his hand, confirming that she is ready. The action shifts to the street. Ash and Lydia are already in a carriage heading for the square. Sitting in the carriage, the girl thinks that it is 11 in the morning and Agrita should have already left the chapel and gone with the charity organisation. Otherwise, they might run into her while wandering around the square. Lydia thinks it's almost noon, and they should be handing out food to the poor in the centre of the square, and they should just not go there. The girl decides that she needs to keep Ash safe from Agrita. The couple arrives at the square and get out of the carriage. She doesn't know what she should do with Ash. As they approach a jewellery store, Lydia notices a beautiful hairpin. Ash, noticing her sister's interest, wonders if she likes it, and the girl, embarrassed, replies that she does. In her mind, angel and demon are fighting, the angel saying there's no time to waltz around looking at hairpins, and the demoness replying that shopping doesn't notice much time. Lydia decides she's going to buy the hairpin after all. She puts her hand in her purse and can't find her wallet. She tries desperately to find it in her purse, but she can't, and she doesn't realise where it is. She thinks it was pickpocketed. Ash, seeing his sister's concern, asks her what happened. 
Lydia thinks that she checked everything before leaving the house and she never forgot her purse. Meanwhile, Ash, unbeknownst to Lydia, gives the clerk the money for the hairpin. Stepping away from the counter, the girl is still wondering when she was robbed and what kind of craftsman was able to do it. Ash discreetly pulls something out of his pocket. He takes out a mysterious balloon and holding it in his hands, tells him to find the man. Lydia, seeing it, doesn't understand what it is and assumes it serves the function of a telephone. But the girl doesn't realise who Ash has given the order to and can't believe he's calling someone from the mansion. Lydia imagines asking the audience who the villainous psychopath in the novel might be secretly associating with. And the answer is a secret organisation, because Ash is a villain after all. She wonders if it could be because he became a duke at such an early age. After his parents died, he needed power, and it had to be more than a one-time help. It had to be a system, but such factions are not created very quickly. Lydia asks what the villain will do in that case, and answers herself. He will kill the current head of this organisation and take his place. She doesn't know how the members of the leaderless group accepted Ash, since he was about 15 years old at the time. She thinks they submitted to his strength. Lydia overhears her brother talking, asking herself, Is he really chatting with the bandits? The girl thinks that the real reason she hasn't been able to escape so far is because of Ash's connection to a secret organisation. If she is caught trying to escape, she will immediately be killed on the spot. Lydia's fear only comes and goes. She prays for her brother to have Agrita. She prays that the goddess will save her from the villain. Just then her pleas are interrupted by her brother, who informs her by a mysterious stone that some time ago a noblewoman with red hair had her purse stolen and that this pickpocket must be found. Lydia wonders if her brother can find someone even from such a meagre description. She believes that the members of the Dark Gang have superpowers. After finishing their conversation, Ash asks his sister if they will go, but the girl asks, not understanding where they should go. The boy replies that it's to the chapel to see her. Ash tells her not to worry, as the thief will be caught soon, and Lydia agrees with her brother. But she thinks to herself that she's more worried about Ash's men than the thieves of his wallet. Walking toward the chapel, the brother wonders if there is anything else his sister would like, but the girl replies in the negative. She is nervous and very tired, but she is obliged to run away tonight anyway. She thinks she has to be careful. If she lets her guard down and crosses the centre of the square, she might run into a greeter. Suddenly, a voice emerges from a mysterious stone inside Ash's jacket to address him and inform him that he has found the thief. The boy orders a report, and Lydia is surprised that the thief was found so quickly. The voice says that the thief is a street pickpocket, so small in stature that he looks like a child, and he's been stealing from people while pretending to be sick. The girl is even more surprised that they were actually able to find the pickpocket with so little information on him. She decides it's some sort of criminal cartel power. Ash realises why he hasn't noticed this thief and asks his location. The voice on the other side of the tube replies that the target is at three o'clock and asks if the Duke can see the roof, the thief is right below it. The couple notices the thief. When Ash sees him, he pulls his sister close to him, startling her. She doesn't understand what this treatment is and thinks that it looks like Ash is going to kill the thief. The pickpocket sees Lydia with Ash and gets scared. The girl thinks to herself that the guy needs to run away. Ash reports that the thief is in the centre of the square and asks why he avoids crowded places. The voice replies that he's running in that direction. The thief is afraid of being caught, and it also sounds like he's trying to escape by giving the stolen goods to his gang. Lydia thinks her brother got the answer he wanted and doesn't realise if he hasn't had enough. The girl doesn't understand where the thief went, but then Ash orders the crook to be eliminated and the gang obeys. Lydia realises with horror that Agrita is in the centre of the square, but it is too late. Before she can say anything, there is an explosion in the centre of the square. Frightened people run from the square. Lydia stands in shock, not realising how Ash blew the place up. She calls her brother a psychopath and breaks the bead again. Waking up in her bed, the girl thanks the Lord for the fact that everything happened just like that. Thanks to that, she took one bead with her when she went out, just in case. She spent it to go back a day. There was a sudden explosion in the central square where Agrita was helping to give out free food as part of a charity event. 
The girl asks what everyone thinks happened to Agrita, and she answers, she's dead again. Punching the pillow, Lydia thinks that there was a sudden big explosion, and if it hadn't been for it, the chapel wouldn't have collapsed this time. The girl asks why it happened the way it did. Is it her fault that her purse was stolen, or is it the pickpocket's fault? The responsibility lies with those who are doing the stealing, right in the middle of the square. And it's the villain's fault that a few pickpockets caused the central square to be bombed. She decides it's worth pondering such a coincidence. Lydia lay back on her pillow and thought, if it had only happened once, then she could understand and accept Ash's problems. But Agrita has died twice, and she finds it suspicious and wonders if Agrita is so unlucky. After a little more thought, she's shocked and asks if it is Ash who is so unlucky. Remembering the beads, Lydia leaps out of bed and takes the bead box out of the closet again. There are exactly 13 of them left. She thinks she has done a good deed. Besides Agrita yesterday, she has saved the lives of many people who were unfortunate enough to come face to face with sudden death. She realises that there was a great benefit in using the bead. Lydia thinks that none of this would have happened if it hadn't been for Ash. Despite her complaints, tomorrow she will go with him to see the clock tower, as if nothing had happened. The girl decides that this time she will definitely return without incident. Time passes, and Lydia and Ash go to see the clock tower again. This time she went to the tower without her purse. She pays no attention to what is around her. She simply takes in the sights, from the walkway to the outside of the square. After walking the entire street without paying any attention to anything, the couple reaches the chapel. Lydia and Ash go up the stairs to the top floor. The brother holds his sister's hand and tells her to be careful, but the girl is surprised that they still continue to escort her up to the clock tower just like that. Nothing happened on the way to the chapel, and Lydia asks if they really made it safely. Upon reaching the top floor, Lydia looks up at the bell. She thinks she has finally seen what she has been trying so hard to see. She pinches herself, thinking it's all a dream, and asks Ash if they can go back now, to which he is surprised. The girl replies that they've already seen the tower after all. The boy says that if that's what his sister wants, then they'll go back. But Lydia suspects that something's not right here. She wonders if it would have been so easy and simple and regrets that it only worked out now. Tears come to her eyes. She took it upon herself to forget the past, but it wasn't fair. She doesn't understand why she would work so hard for something so simple. Ash is worried after seeing her sister's tears. Lydia realises that her precious beads, to her deep regret, have already been broken. The boy asks the girl why she's crying. But she, wiping her tears with her finger, replies that she's just glad she finally got to see the tower. She thinks to herself that she's half honest. Seeing Agrita's third death was something she didn't want to do. Guy replies that if he had known Lydia would like it so much, he would have brought her here sooner and apologises to her for his inattention. The girl thinks she was so happy to see the tower that she unwittingly became a little sensitive. She decides that Ash is really sorry as he wipes the tears with his hand from her face. Lydia thinks the most important thing is to get what you want. With Ash by her side, she walks into the chapel and Agrita is still alive, something Lydia has been so desperate to get. Now, all she has left to do is go home and prepare her travel bag for her escape. When she returns home, she realises that this is the last time she'll feel anxious in this house. She thought so, but plans have changed. The girl had originally had no intention of going to tonight's reception and tried to find all sorts of excuses. When the party started, she had expected to pack her belongings and take off, but she feels so insecure. She feels insecure because she has already witnessed the death of the main character twice, quite unexpectedly. At least she's seen her in the main hall among the guests. She decides that one way or another, once Ash and Agrita are safely face to face, Lydia will immediately slip away. Bessie, having finished Lydia's makeup, informs her of this and tells her she can look in the mirror. When she sees herself in the mirror, the girl is shocked. She realises that Bessie worked so hard on her while she was immersed in her thoughts. Bessie says there will be no one prettier than the girl at the reception tonight, but Lydia is still looking in the mirror and is shocked at how much effort the maid has put in. She replies to Bessie that there will be no one prettier than her except Ash, to which the maid doesn't realise who the girl is comparing her to. 
but Lydia thinks that frankly she's not kidding either. Having finished the finishing touches, Bessie says it's done and Lydia replies that it's a beautiful job. There is a knock on the door and Bessie announces that Ash seems to be here. She unlocks the door and asks Ash to come in. Lydia thinks it's time for the main character of the evening to appear. She thinks it's a charming appearance by the villainous psychopath. Walking up to Lydia, Ash tells her it's time to go. Lydia reaches out to Ash, thinking that it is the villains and psychopaths who get love letters sent non-stop. Eloquent messages are sent relentlessly to the house, from personal love letters to marriage proposals sent by other families. But Ash, of course, has never answered these letters and will continue to do so in the future. From now on, his attention will belong to Agrita alone. Lydia thinks it's safe to say that anyway, but she has a little hobby. Anyway, she's going to burn Ash's confession along with her own in the fireplace. At first she was just helping Bessie deal with these kinds of letters, but it's turning out to be more interesting than she thought it would be. Other than that, Ash seems pleased with her hobby. Time after time she burns the message, and her mood improves. She thinks it will save them wood. The couple arrives at the entrance to the main hall, where they are greeted by two servants. They ask them to enter, and then open the doors in front of them. Finally, the protagonist appears at the very last moment. All the people in the hall stare at the couple. Lydia thinks that there was always such a silence with Ash's appearance. She thinks it's very similar to the main character's effect. People in the audience greet Ash and Lydia, saying they are honoured to meet them. They add that the couple always looks so beautiful, like they've stepped out of a painting. Lydia looks around the room and doesn't realise where the main character, Agrita Grace, is. She says she just has to look at her. The girl has read the book many times and knows that the first thing that catches her eye is her brown hair. She recognises her without a problem. From the back, you can see how clean and piercing she is. Suddenly, the girl finds Agrita amongst the crowd. She thinks her beauty may seem rather ordinary, but her face is special, and under the curve of her eyelashes you can see what a rare beauty she is. Lydia thinks it was mentioned in the book that even without makeup, Agrita looked beautiful and delicate. It sounds simple to her, but she doesn't understand how it's possible to be beautiful with no effort, no fancy outfits or expensive jewellery. The more she looks at Agrita, the harder it is for her to look away from her. The girl thinks of Ash and wonders what about him. She turns to her brother and their gazes meet. Lydia can't understand why her brother is staring at her and not looking at Agrita. Ash reaches his hand out to the girl and plucks the thread sticking out of her dress, which makes Lydia puzzled. She doesn't understand how the thread on her dress could possibly be bothering him now. She thinks that Agrita is standing right in the hall in a prominent place and Ash only needs to look at her. She doesn't understand if it's hard for him to look the other way. Lydia looks at Ash and asks in her mind if he shouldn't see her as his destination, but her brother seems impenetrable. Ash wonders after seeing his sister looking at him if she wants to say something, but Lydia replies that she doesn't want to say anything. She wonders why her brother isn't looking at Agrita. She doesn't understand what happened and begs him to look at the main character. But Ash keeps looking at his sister. The girl decides to take matters into her own hands. She thinks, since Ash doesn't want to look at Agrita, She'll make him personally, she yells, pointing at where Agrita is, asking what's wrong there. Suddenly, a chandelier comes down over where Agrita is standing and flies straight at her. The chandelier kills Agrita Grace, which leaves all the people in shock. Lydia, being in complete incomprehension, just watches the whole thing. The commotion has spread to everyone in the room and she wonders if something wrong has happened. The reception was cancelled, of course, because the chandelier had fallen. The butler and Ash, after apologising to everyone, sent the guests home. Lydia stands against the wall, contemplating what is happening. It seems to her that something is really wrong. It seems strange to her, and she assumes that the book is killing the main character with a chandelier. This is too much even for the killers. This incident looks like an accident, all because the chandelier's fastening came loose. However, the servant who confirmed it seemed suspicious to her. In her opinion, is it impossible to check the chandelier before an event of this magnitude? Besides, there are only five chandeliers in the banquet hall, and only one of them has a problem, and it's the one that was supposed to fall from above, right on top of Agrita. 
Lydia thinks that no matter how unlucky the heroine is, she can't be that unlucky. The girl bites her finger, thinking that Agrita has managed to die three times, which means it's all about Agrita's fate. She's destined to die. She recalls seeing a movie with a similar plot in her past life. The main characters are destined to die, but they luckily survive, however. The world doesn't leave it that way. Agrita will die according to her destiny, and since it's like that, the world will continue to kill her. The girl thinks it shouldn't have happened, chasing away the bad thoughts. If that's the case, her plans aren't meant to happen, she can't accept that. She thinks it's unacceptable. The world of this novel has no reason to kill off its own heroine. Lydia puts her hand to her forehead. She can't find any answers, her head is splitting. Suddenly, she is approached by Ash, who sees that her sister doesn't look so good and wonders if she's all right. After looking at her, he holds out his hand and tells her to go upstairs and rest. He walks her out. Lydia takes her brother's hand and the pair walk upstairs. Ash walks her sister to her room and leaves her, asking her to rest. Lydia looks at her hand, thinking that though she can't figure out what's wrong, one thing is certain. She needs a greeter. Time passes. The girl sits again on the floor with the box of beads, thinking that if she reverses time just after the banquet is over, she must come back and see the chapel. Taking one bead in her hand, she thinks that now that enough time has passed, it will only be an hour until the banquet. A man digs a well when he is thirsty. But what if Lydia's wish is to live? With that question in mind, the girl breaks the bead again. The girl moves through time and appears as Bessie was working on her makeup. She gets up abruptly and walks away, which shocks the maid. She doesn't realize where the girl is going. As she leaves, Lydia regrets that she has already used three whole beads, but thinks she should try it anyway. As she goes out into the hall, she calls out to the clerk, Alex, saying she can't delay and asks if he could lower the chandelier and check it, to which he of course responds positively. Alex takes the chandelier down and inspects it and finds a fault. He doesn't understand why it doesn't have a fixture and asks for a new one, saying he needs to fix it. He hooks the new fixture, thinking that now he will have to inspect the other chandeliers as well. Another servant tells Lydia that it would be dangerous to leave everything like this. After all, there could be an accident during the banquet, and asks how the girl knew about it, to which she replies that she just had a bad dream. Having finished with the chandelier, Lydia thinks she is fine, but begins to see danger in other things, in the statue, in the vase. She's very worried. The girl tells the clerk that she had an incredibly bad feeling, and the dream was so ominous, she asks if they postpone the start of the banquet. Will it be possible to change the decoration and layout of the banquet hall? To which the clerk replies positively, he will do whatever the girl says. Lydia starts ordering her subordinates to get rid of jewellery that she thinks might harm Agrita. If there's any insecurity at all, a problem is inevitable. The girl shouts, pointing at everything for the servants to get rid of it. She thinks it's impossible to ignore the threats. While all the helpers do Lydia's bidding, Bessie paints the girl for the evening. When she is finished, she informs her mistress that everything is ready, and Lydia replies that it is an excellent job. After looking around the hall, she thinks there are no dangers, and she has done all she can do. A subordinate approaches Lydia and informs her that Ash will be ready soon, and she should go upstairs, to which she agrees and is about to go. Suddenly, she notices a rug and informs the subordinate. She thinks the material looks unreliable. Ladies in high heels might slip and fall, and a change is required, to which the clerk obeys. The girl thinks that it looks strange and fussy in the eyes of others. Even those who were silently obeying instructions now looked confused. But Lydia thinks she doesn't care about the opinion of others, any better than losing Agrita and having to repair the mansion afterward. It doesn't matter to her what people think of her. The most important thing is to prevent Agrita's death. Nothing is more important than that. Lydia clenches her fist and thinks she has to find out what the problem is. Before breaking the bead, she came to the conclusion that there must be something wrong with Agrita. If the fact that the world really wants to get rid of the protagonist is true, then the world has some kind of problem, or maybe it's in the heroine herself. Meanwhile, the girl comes upstairs and asks if Ash is ready. Walking hand in hand with him, she thinks the problem might be both. Dealing with the world's problems on your own is actually very difficult. 
so even the main female protagonist should take a closer look. She'll have to keep an eye on Agrita throughout the banquet. Suddenly Ash asks if Lydia is nervous, to which she replies positively, but she thinks she has no reason to be nervous. She is attending the banquet with Ash as a member of the family, but can't say it's because of Agrita. The couple walks towards the door to the main hall. Lydia suddenly tells Ash to tremble because today is his coming of age and it's a big day. But Ash only stares at her in silence. Then the girl wonders if he understood. The girl replies that everyone has arrived and needs to go. The ushers open the door to the hall. As she enters, the girl is sure that everything will work out today, just like last time. Everyone greets Ash and Lydia. They are honored to meet them. To them, they always look beautiful, as if they came from paintings. The girls congratulate the Duke on his 18th birthday. Lydia thinks this is no different from last time. There will be no accident this time. Seeing Agrita in the crowd talking to one of the guests, she thinks that nothing has changed since Agrita returned that day. She thinks Ash's indifference to the heroine is disconcerting. Suddenly, she notices Agrita walking straight towards them and assumes she's going to go over and say hello to Ash. She doesn't know if it matters when the heroine dies. At this point, Agrita's survival is paramount to her and asks her to be careful with the chandelier. Suddenly, Agrita is stopped by one of the guests and says something to her, whereupon she turns around and walks the other way, leaving Lydia in shock. She wonders if Agrita will go out back, walking through the centre of the room, initially before talking about sponsorship. Ash asks her what her name is. They almost hit it off, but it looks like the moment was lost. The girl watches Agrita walk out into the backyard and thinks what's wrong with Agrita. She goes into the garden and Lydia doesn't know if she'll find a tree or bush to hide behind. She imagines Agrita falling on a rock and dying and thinks it's dangerous. The girl thinks that Ash was originally supposed to follow her, but she's not sure if he will. Therefore, the girl has no choice but to follow her herself and she sets out to follow Agrita. Looking out into the backyard, she looks for Agrita and spots her sitting on the fountain. Standing behind a tree and watching Agrita, the girl thinks about whether she should keep following her or maybe approach her. She can't read minds and doesn't know if that means she can follow her. She can't help it and decides to walk over and talk to her. Suddenly, Agrita takes off her shoe and says that she feels like these shoes are made of cheap material. But they are so expensive and she doesn't understand why her feet hurt so much. She thinks it's because of her weak body. Hearing this, Lydia wonders if Agrita was such a person. She has subtracted everything she knows from the book. But then again, even celebrities off camera can be quite different. She orders herself to stop being afraid and just walk over and talk to Agrita. Agrita keeps talking. She asks herself when she can go back and says she doesn't even have a cell phone, so she can't even find her way back. Hearing this, Lydia goes into complete shock. When Lydia came up to Agrita and called out to her, Lydia asked about her cell phone. Agrita was scared and asked who she was, but she covered her mouth with her hands and realised that Lydia had heard all her conversations, and now she didn't know how to explain it to the girl. But Agrita makes it up and replies that it's just the name of a toy she played with as a child. Lydia, thinking there's no such thing, asks Agrita if she's from Korea. Agrita, grabbing Lydia's hands, cheerfully asks if she is also from Korea and if she is really Korean. But the girl only remains silent, not knowing what to say. Agrita can't believe she was able to meet a Korean woman in such a place and doesn't know how such a thing is even possible. She felt lonely, but she feels much better now. She apologises to Lydia, saying that she is just surprised and very happy. But the girl doesn't understand how it happened and why Agrita. There was nothing in that book about Agrita being from Korea. But Lydia, no matter how hard she tried to remember, definitely didn't read about it. She assumes that Agrita did remember her past life and thinks the author just didn't write about it. She doesn't know how she should handle this situation. Agrita asks Lydia how she got here, but the girl doesn't understand at first. Then Agrita apologises and says that she started talking nonsense because she is just happy. She asks again how Lydia came to this place. It is written about this place in a book. But the girl questions herself. She feels awkward and doesn't know if she's from Korea or just Korean. All these questions are too poignant to answer, instead of talking about the reason for reincarnation. Suddenly, Agrita informs her that she should tell first before asking. 
In fact, there is nothing interesting in it for her. When she went to the dining room, she was going down the stairs, but it was wet and slippery. She was sloppy and accidentally slipped, and when she opened her eyes, she was already in this world. Lydia is shocked by this, and she interjects everything. Agrita replies that it's all strange. She was caught up in a novel she only recently heard about. Lydia is surprised by this. Agrita asks Lydia what happened when she calls her sister, and asks if she can call the girl that, since she does look like her sister. They woke up at some point in a strange place and in someone else's body, and are now in a fictional world, with Agrita as the main character. But suddenly Lydia asks if this means that Agrita is not real, to which Agrita answers positively. Agrita is the name of the owner of this body, and her name is Ari. The girl, after telling everything, asks what Lydia's name is, but the girl is in shock. She realises that she and Agrita came to this world differently, and replies to her that she is not like Agrita. She was not suddenly here at all. Life in Korea was her past life, and after she died, she was reborn here. Then Agrita clarifies if Lydia's from here. She asks if she knows Korea or remembers her past life, after which she exclaims happily. She wonders how this happened, because it's just amazing, and she can't believe it could happen. But Lydia just stands there in bewilderment again. Then Lydia asks Ari when she woke up in this body, and she replies that it was recently, like four days ago. Then Lydia realises that it wasn't that long ago that Shin Ari entered Agrita's body, and Agrita, meanwhile, started dying in all sorts of ways, and she assumes that Ari was the problem all along. She thinks the world is killing Agrita because someone outsider has entered the protagonist's body. Shin Ari has unfortunately infiltrated Agrita's body, and from the world's perspective, she is a stranger here just as the human body rejects foreign bodies. Lydia assumes that this world is killing Shin Ari to get rid of her, but she thinks it's crazy because it's too much, and eventually the world will kill her. Anyway, if Agrita dies and Shin Ari's soul returns to her world, Lydia doesn't know what will become of the real protagonist and doesn't know if she will be considered dead. Agrita worries about the brooding Lydia and asks if she's okay, and Lydia calls this world crazy. The girl asks Ari to ask her about one thing, to which the girl is delighted and responds positively. Lydia asks how Ari knew she was in the novel and asks if she found the book there in Korea. But Ari replies that she didn't know at first. After she woke up in that body, she wandered around all day until she happened to go to a library. There she went through a lot of books and found out about everything by reading one of them. She recalls that the book was called the spring of the goddess Agrita, and Lydia confirms this. Ari goes on to say that everything pointed to her being caught up in the novel, and it seems like she's the main character here. Lydia realises that Shinari is adapting quickly. Ari says that to some extent this body has memories, and she's trying very hard to pretend to be Agrita. Then Lydia ponders that Ari has decided to follow the plot, using the body owner's memories and information from the book which is why she's now attending the banquet as she is, and there is nothing for Lydia to change if she follows Agrita. Then Ari says she wondered if acting like this would get her home, but Lydia wonders how she can tell her that she's died three times already, seeing her pale face. Ari says she wonders if she's doing everything right. So far, everything has gone smoothly and without problems. She's going to try and follow the same path in the future. But Lydia asks herself, can we be sure that this world is killing Agrita in order to expel Shin Ari from her body, and that is the only option? To solve the problem, you need to bring Shin Ari back to her own world, but the girl doesn't know how to do that. She doesn't know if Agrita will be able to return to her body if Ari moves back to Korea. Lydia still doesn't understand anything. Ari distracts her and asks if there really isn't a pond here, but Lydia doesn't understand what a pond has to do with it. Ari replies that they figured out that they had different moving circumstances and different situations. She was so excited to meet Lydia, but she forgot to put her shoes on in all the commotion. Ari says she should put her shoes on, but she could use a foot wash first and asks again if Lydia knows where the pond might be. The girl replies that he may be in the courtyard, at which point Ari replies that he will go and walks away, leaving Lydia alone. But then Lydia yells at Ari to stand and orders him to go back immediately and not to go anywhere under the pretext of danger. 
but Ari doesn't understand how the pond could be so dangerous. Lydia rushes after Ari, thinking she's going barefoot to the pond and getting stung by a poisonous ant. But Ari replies that she's just going to rinse her feet, and even if she falls in the water, she can swim, but she suddenly falls in the water. Lydia yells to Ari and thinks that the depth of the pond isn't that deep, but absolutely everything is a danger to a greeter right now. Lydia takes off her shoes, thinking she can't let her die, and rushes into the pond to help Ari. She asks her to wait a moment, but Agrita doesn't hear her. The girl thinks the good thing is that she learned to swim and there is no one to save Ari but her. She tells Agrita to just calm down. Lydia thinks she will save at least someone from drowning. When rescuing a drowning person, it's worth considering that once they fall into the water, they become exhausted and eventually run out of energy. So the girl has to save Agrita, but she doesn't know what to do. Lydia went lower following Ari, so she holds her breath. She thinks to inhale, exhale and dive in, but immediately refuses to do so. Suddenly, Ash grabs her arm and pulls her completely out of the water. Ash stands up and pulls out his sword, causing the girl to go into shock and pass out. She wakes up in her bed in her nightgown. She remembers that the last thing she saw was Ash unsheathing his sword. The girl sits up on the bed and notices Ash in front of her. She asks what he's doing here, to which he lays her down on her pillow and asks her to sleep some more. But Lydia talks about a greeter, but Ash interrupts her. He says that if his sister wants him to, and it doesn't matter what, he'll do anything if that's Lydia's wish. He adds that this time he's a little angry. Lydia thinks that when she met Ash at the pond, she thought he was angry, but that was just the beginning. The girl apologizes to her brother, realizing that she made him worry. However, she is his little sister while Ash is the only one who shows concern and yet gets angry. But she's not his sister. She's just someone he's going to kill, and it's a very natural future. But the girl doesn't understand why it's so heavy on her heart. She realises that if she were to ask about Agrita's well-being now, he certainly wouldn't answer her. Ash tells Lydia to go to sleep, fall asleep and wake up sooner. She can think about everything in the morning. Lydia wakes up in the morning. She rises abruptly from her pillow and thinks she dreamed the whole thing. She remembers talking to Ash, but she's not sure if it was in a dream or real. The girl gets out of bed and, putting on her slippers, wonders what happened to Agrita. Suddenly the door unlocks and Agrita comes flying in, calling Lydia her little sister and rushing over to her. The girl stands in confusion as Ari hugs her. Bessie enters the room with the doctor. The doctor asks Lydia how she is she replies that she is fine while the doctor checks her pulse. While hugging Agrita and holding her hand while the doctor checks her pulse, Lydia doesn't realise what this strange situation is. Suddenly, Agrita looks at the girl and says she was scared, and Lydia agrees with her. Lydia hugs Agrita and feels her warmth under her palm, realising that she is alive, but she doesn't understand if Ash saved her, and if so, why he bare his sword. Agrita asks Lydia if that pond was cursed, but the girl doesn't understand her because it's just an ordinary pond. The protagonist says she wishes she knew what was wrong with it and she should have listened to Lydia when she tried to warn her. Here the doctor reports that Agrita seems to have her leg cramped up in the water, then something wrapped around her ankle and she wouldn't have been able to get out on her own anyway. Agrita really thought she was going to die in the pond. Lydia assumes it was tangled seaweed, and that's why Ash exposed his sword. She thinks it's somehow peaceful and altruistic, just the way it is, and doesn't really dock. After checking on the girl, the doctor reports that she's fine. He also adds that if it weren't for the Duke, she'd be in trouble, to which Bessie agrees. She asks Lydia what if she had jumped blindly, since it doesn't matter how many people fall for it. Suddenly, Agrita hugs the girl harder and apologises to her, saying that it was all because of her. But Lydia denies this, saying that it was her decision to jump after her, which makes Bessie even angrier. The doctor reports that everyone was very worried about Lydia, especially the Duke. He hasn't even gotten much rest, all the while watching Lydia while she sleeps, and it wasn't until a while ago that he fell asleep. Bessie, with a worried and serious face, informs him that they will be here. So even if they ask the girls to go out, they will have to comply. Lydia realises that she didn't dream it, Ash stayed by her side all night. She realises that he is compassionate, 
And even though they are family, she can't find someone like that anywhere else. The girl remembers when her parents passed away. It has been many years since Ash was left alone with Lydia. Suddenly, Bessie approaches the girl and asks her to take care of herself. They would do the same if they were Lydia, but she asks that Lydia think of the Duke, because the Duke does care about the lady. The girl thinks that Bessie's voice was so soft and sincere, but it sounds ironic. After listening to Bessie's request, she realised even more clearly what she would have to die because of. Ash, who doesn't appreciate others and is the only one who can give you a heart and he only has Lydia left. But Ash thinks his sister is the one and only special person for him and gives her love without a doubt. The girl doesn't know how he'll feel when he finds out it's all a lie. She realises that there's no way he'll let her live. Suddenly, the doctor hits Bessie and tells her not to make stuff up here. Bessie asks what nonsense the doctor is talking about, but he replies that the lady didn't fall into the pond on purpose, and Bessie keeps nagging, but Bessie doesn't react well to it. The doctor and Bessie continue to argue amongst themselves, but Lydia asks them to stop and not argue. She reports that she is perfectly fine and there is no need to fight. She tells the doctor that she is fine, and Bessie informs him that she is right. She will definitely be careful in the future but in her mind, the girl thinks she can't reconcile them. Bessie says that since the girl is awake, she must wash herself and she will bring her hot water. But Lydia says that cold water is fine. But Bessie resists and asks the girl to just wait for her to bring water. The doctor informs her that he will also go, and if the girl feels indisposed, she can call the doctor at any time. He also seriously asks Lydia not to do any self-diagnosis, she doesn't need to take it as something trivial and not particularly important because it is really dangerous and the girl agrees with him. Ari, sitting on the bed behind her, thinks that Lydia wants to stay with her. But after seeing the doctor and Bessie off, the girl tells her that they will see each other later in the dining room and asks her to leave. After seeing everyone off, Lydia thinks that she will finally be able to rest and be alone with herself. But suddenly, there is a knock on the door which startles the girl. She opens the door, behind which stands the butler, and asks Lydia if she is all right, to which she replies in the affirmative. Butler suddenly asks Lydia why she jumped into the pond, for it is possible to drown in a pond and should not be taken lightly. She should keep in mind that from now on, instead of diving herself, it's best to call someone for help, and if no one is around, it's best to just pray for the drowning person. The butler continues to nag and lecture Lydia, which gives her a headache, and she realises that it is real nagging. She asks him to leave her alone. After that, the butler kept grumbling non-stop, causing Lydia to flee the room, unable to stand it. Grace's family paid a visit to the Wingrid family and thanked Lydia for saving her daughter. Lydia thinks it was certainly fun, but she still feels the coldness of the water and realises that Ash was the one who saved Agrita. Grace's family thanked them wordlessly, but soon left. And they arrived just after Lydia woke up. Standing in her room, the girl thinks this is some kind of madness. Sitting down in a chair, she thinks she needs to get her thoughts together. She reasons that in any case, Agrita is now unconditionally doomed to die anyway, and is being killed by the world itself because she is not the real Agrita. Since Shinari has infiltrated Agrita's body, the world is trying to kill her to escort her out. She asks herself if it is possible to save Agrita, who is destined to die. It is possible, but the girl is far from saving Agrita. She actually accompanies her on her journey to the underworld. In other words, she can't do it alone and will need help here. But the girl is actually glad that she can be saved. Lydia thinks that the current Agrita, or rather Shin Ari, might be able to help her a little. The girl would like to confess everything that's on her heart, but the problem is that she's not sure how she feels. All she needs is for Agrita to get Ash's attention, and all in order to leave the mansion safely. But Lydia realises that Ash was only attracted to Agrita because she was Agrita. But the girl actually doubts it. Ash was by her side while she slept, so he sat by her side all night. If everything had gone according to the story, Ash would have seen Agrita and fallen in love with her at first sight. Then, it wouldn't have been Lydia, but a greeter he stayed with last night. 
The girl thinks it's all too ambiguous and it upsets her. She suggests to herself to think positive. The only thing she can count on is Agrita. Without her, she will die without ever accomplishing what she had planned. She's really afraid of dying during the escape. On top of all that, Ash is not someone to fall in love with. Even though the events differ from the plot of the book, Ash still saved Agrita. And even if it's not the love at first sight that was in the novel, there's still hope. And since that's the case, there's only one thing left for Lydia to do now. Suddenly, Bessie peeks out from behind the door, asking the girl if she's finished with her water treatment and should get something to eat. But Lydia replies that she was just about to, and Bessie asks if she should bring breakfast to her room, but Lydia replies that she'd better set the table. She'll eat there to keep Agrita alive somehow. Walking to the dining room, Lydia thinks she needs to tell Ari everything. She needs to know why she's getting into trouble. Right now she is in the dark, but they can at least avoid anything that is a danger to her, and the only question left is how to get Ari to believe her. On the way, Lydia meets Ari, who calls her sister, causing the butler standing next to her to be shocked. He informs Agrita that it is customary to speak more respectfully when dealing with higher status aristocrats, and asks to be allowed to explain further. When Lydia hears this, she thinks the butler is only doing this to her, but he doesn't care who he lectures. Suddenly, Lydia sees a bee beside her, which startles all the servants. The girl thinks that there is nothing surprising about a flying bee. It could have come from the front yard garden or across the street, but suddenly realises. She shouts for everyone to catch the bee, for it is poisonous. If anyone gets stung, they will die on the spot. The bee looked like the most ordinary bee, so everyone was puzzled. But the girl can be sure for sure. If Ari is around, there's definitely something wrong with the bee. Lydia thinks that catching a bee will bring her closer to Agrita, but she can't touch something poisonous and doesn't know what else she can catch a bee with besides her hands. Suddenly Agrita screams in pain, which scares Lydia, but suddenly someone kills the bee with a swing. The unknown man says that he is fortunately not late and informs her that he and the girl haven't seen each other for a long time. He apologises for the delay. Once he returned, he did not leave his service for a moment and was ordered to accompany the lady. This man renders Darbury, a loyal knight of the family. After introducing himself, he asks not to tell the gentleman what he overslept on. Suddenly, he asks what his punishment will be and wonders if he deserved it, for it seems to him that he should have earned it. Lydia is shocked to see Darbury. The servants surround the knight. A servant girl reports that she didn't know the knight was here, and another courtier says that the knight's skills are still good. He was even able to chop such a small bee. The courtier asks the lady if this spittle is really poisonous, which leaves Darbury shocked. The doctor, hearing about the poisonous bee, comes running over. After putting the bee on a piece of paper, Lydia gives it to the doctor. Everyone asks where the bee came from and if it's really poisonous. The doctor answers in the affirmative. The bee is very toxic, and he is surprised that such a bee was found here. He reports that if it had stung him, he would not have survived, and asks if the bee has stung anyone. Lydia realises that Agrita, after all, almost died again. The doctor asks Lydia how she knew the bee was poisonous, for if it hadn't been for her and Sir Darbury, things might have ended very badly. Looking at Agrita, Lydia calls out to her and asks if she can be distracted for a moment. Agrita thinks she's so stunned she can't find words. Just yesterday she almost survived drowning, and this time she almost died from a poisonous bee sting. Lydia thinks this is a good opportunity for her. If she tells everything now, Agrita will willingly believe her. Darbury follows the girls saying it was poison, but anyone was fooled. At first glance, the bee looked quite normal. In the future, if the girls see a bee in the mansion, they should kill it immediately. Lydia doesn't realise how much longer the knight will follow them. She turns to him and informs him that she has a conversation with Agrita and asks if he could wait for them outside the door. But Darbury replies, in the negative, as he says he has been given orders not to leave the girls for a moment. But Lydia replies that the subject of their conversation is very important but Darbury informs her that the girl might hit him if he blabbed to anyone. Lydia thinks she's completely forgotten that Sir Darbury is excessively dodgy, so she's powerless against Ash's orders. The girl shouts to Darbury that it is impossible to talk quietly in front of strangers, to which he replies that he will plug his ears. 
Lydia asks if Darbury can hear everything, even with his ears closed. She asks him, after a moment's thought, what awaits him for insubordination. She informs him that she will tell Mr Ash everything, that Sir Darbury's negligence almost caused her death. She cries out to him whether he will be able to make it to sunrise after such words, and that it would not be a bad idea to see the moon in time. Darbury is shocked by such words. He replies that it's not true. There's really no excuse for his tardiness. But he was almost stung. But Lydia replies that it makes no difference and asks who he thinks Ash will believe. Darbury slaps his hand to his face, realising he has nothing to counter. Lydia informs him that she likes talented people like Sir Darbury and hopes he will continue to serve the Wingrid family for a long time to come. The girls enter the room and the knight remains outside the door. The girl mentally apologises to Darbury and asks him to show a little patience, because people's lives depend on it. Seated at the table, Lydia tells Agrita, if she is hungry, that she should eat first and only afterwards have a talk. But Agrita replies that she wanted to eat, but her appetite is completely gone. After drinking a glass of water, Agrita starts yelling how that bee could have been poisonous in the first place and asks if a bee could be so dangerous. This is the first time she has met a poisonous bee. She doesn't understand why a bee would just fly around them so easily. And isn't it awful she almost died for such a stupid reason, and does it make sense? Listening to all this flow, Lydia thinks she can't find a moment to cut in. Agrita reports that, come to think of it, she was strangely unlucky at the pond yesterday too. She thinks it's some kind of curse. Maybe it's not the pond, but this mansion itself. Finished, Ari apologises for her gross speculation. Lydia thinks everything is right and well said. Here, Agrita asks what the girl wanted to tell her. She informs her that she is much younger than Lydia herself. She is 17, to which the girl is surprised. Ari adds that if you count by local reckoning, she is 16 or 15 because she was born in winter. Lydia can't believe that Ari is only 15. Ari reports that she slipped on the school stairs, and I think it was the day of a practice test. She was so nervous after taking the test, so in her haste, she was too careless. After finishing her conversation, she still asks what Lydia wanted to talk about, but the girl is in shock that Ari is only 15 and she is so immature. The words that not long ago she was ready to utter are stuck in her throat. She thinks Ari is destined to die, and if she wishes to avoid her fate, she must be extremely careful. Before she realised the situation, she was trying to save her in every way possible because they need her. Lydia has to save Agrita for the sake of her own future, and yet she needed to say it. Seeing Lydia slumped, Ari asks if she's okay, but then the girl asks if Ari wants to live. The girl doesn't understand what Lydia is saying and interjects, but the girl tells her to choose. The action shifts to a corridor, where Lydia is walking down the hallway with bad thoughts. The girl walks with her head down, straight towards the wall, but she is stopped by Darbury's hand, who tells her that if she hurts herself, she's screwed. He wouldn't want to die, so if she's angry, she should try using words. Lydia only looks at Darbury in silence, turns around and walks away. She thinks she's the kind of person who doesn't care about others and doesn't realise since when she became so conscientious. She thinks she was so rational, even when she was stealing beads. But once she met Shinari, she couldn't withstand the rush of guilt and remorse. Her confidence that she should keep Ari alive for the sake of her plan simply vanished. Lydia thinks she knew she was weak when it comes to children, covering her face with her hands. She thinks that this is the way to go crazy. Now her future depends on Agrita's decision. If she chooses to just die, Lydia will lose the opportunity to change the future that has been prepared for her. Having said goodbye to Agrita, she will have to prepare herself for a grim and tragic end. She made this mess on her own, so she has no one to blame. Suddenly, the girl is approached by Bessie, who hands her a tray with a glass. She says that it is honey water. She was going to take it to the Duke's bedroom for him to drink when he wakes up and asks if the girl can do it instead. Lydia is shocked, but Bessie adds that she and her brother will see each other. When she reaches Ash's room, she knocks, and then suddenly he tells her to come in. The girl is shocked that her brother was awake. Entering the room, she sees Ash sitting at the table, all business. Seeing her sister, he asks if she has any business with him. 
Lydia replies that she has come to give him something, namely honey water, whereupon she quickly hands the tray of water to Ash. The Duke realises that Bessie made the water, and the girl thinks that Bessie thinks honey water is a panacea. Ash asks why Lydia didn't ask someone to fetch it, since she only caused herself trouble. Setting aside the tray of water, he informs his sister to sit for a while, after which she can go, to which the girl agrees. Seeing her brother put the tray aside, she realises that Ash will not drink the water. Once seated, Ash wonders how his sister is feeling. She replies that she is fine, she feels completely healthy, her body is light, and she sleeps well too. Ash looks at Lydia carefully, and she realises that he is trying to figure out if she is lying or not. After an awkward silence, Lydia asks back as Ash. He doesn't understand what his sister is asking, and she informs him that she just heard that he hadn't rested all night, so she thought he must be asleep now, and wonders why he's sitting up all business. Ash replies that if he works in the study, the butler will bore him. Lydia thinks she wasn't interested, and just wanted to know if he was tired. Ash adds that he's not tired enough to want to sleep. Lydia is surprised by this, but thinks Ash looks quite alert, but he did say he didn't sleep at all. Suddenly, Ash takes the girl's hair with his hands, which makes her startle. But he informs her that it's very windy outside. The girl thinks he scared her, but he was just fixing her hair. She realises that she didn't go anywhere, but she remembers that she had been rubbing her hair after talking to Ari and realises that she had been walking around shaggy the whole time. She thinks Sir Darbury could have at least told her that, but he's really only concerned with guarding her. Lydia agrees that the weather is a bit windy, Suddenly he shouts to Ash and asks why he's lying. She says he's not tired, but that's not true. He's talking slower than usual. Lydia thinks that as a child Ash also spoke slower when he was tired. It's not easy to understand, but she easily recognised her brother's mood even back then. She thinks Ash has grown up, but surprisingly, he still has the same habit he had as a child. Even a psychopathic villain has a sweet side. Ash wonders how she knew about it, since he thought it wasn't so obvious. But Lydia replies that once you listen, it's immediately clear. But Ash denies it negatively, saying that only Lydia knows about it. Ash reports that he wasn't lying. He says it's not that he's not tired at all, just not tired enough to fall asleep. But Lydia replies that her brother said he didn't rest at all during the night, but he replies that he's fine and asks if Lydia is worried about him. Lydia, wringing her hands in embarrassment, replies that of course she is worried, because they are family. But in her head, she resists it, since they're not even related once. Ash looks at Lydia in silence, then abruptly grabs a glass of honey water off the tray and drinks it in a gulp. Lydia wonders if his throat is dry. Ash replies that this sometimes happens when he is very thirsty. Lydia thinks her brother has a cold, because when you're sick, your throat suddenly gets dry. But the last time Ash was sick was when he was a little boy. She says he's been up all night and is tired, so his throat is dry, which makes Ash wonder. The girl thinks that even though Ash convinces her that everything is fine, his condition says otherwise. Suddenly, Ash turns to Lydia and asks if she likes Agrita Grace. The girl is surprised by this question, but her brother Lee looks at her with a smile, then asks if he should make a doll of her. Lydia replies sharply in the negative, frightened, but her brother does not understand why she refuses, for it will be more comfortable. She won't be able to move at will, so she won't fall into the pond again, and Lydia won't jump in after her. The girl assumes that Ash is scolding her right now for throwing herself into the water. Duke informs her that Lydia can do what she wants and he's not going to interfere, but in return, if anything happens to her, he won't leave the others alone. Ash, stepping closer to Lydia, informs her that that's all she needs to know. The girl realises that this means he will eventually kill someone if she gets hurt. She asks Ash who he means by the others, and he replies that everyone but Lydia herself. Actions carry forward. The girl leaves Ash's room and is met by Darbury, who wonders if the lady has passed the honey water. Lydia only looks at Darbury in silence and says that he is just another life depending on herself. She recalls Ash telling her that he will kill everyone but her, and that voice is still in her ears. She'd had some thoughts at one time or another. For example, she speculated about what would happen if she were Ash's real big sister. She wonders if she would then be able to say with a smile on her face that her brother is just a bit of an impulsive person. She would have been able to genuinely enjoy Ash's overprotective behaviour. 
Every time he singles her out and addresses her differently, like this time, she has no choice but to put herself in the shoes of people who are strangers to him, because that's her real place. Even though she is still a part of this family, sooner or later, they will get rid of her. She will be accused of pretending to be something she was not, and the price for that will be nothing less than death. Walking down the corridor, Darbury asks why Lydia has stopped. She thinks there is no point in delving into such dark thoughts. She asks the knight what kinship means to him and how much he cares about his family, to which he replies that he has no family, which leaves the girl shocked. She'd forgotten who Darbury used to be orphaned and wandering the nooks and crannies. At the time, Ash recognised his talent and brought him along. She informs him that she didn't say that on purpose, she was just curious what other people thought of it. But the knight, with a smile, replies that he will answer Lydia later, when he is married and has a family of his own. The girl doesn't understand why he would go that far, but he replies that she asked. Lydia thinks that he has already made her feel uncomfortable. Darbury replies that if he had a baby sister, he would always keep her safe. He would probably fulfil all her whims to the best of his ability, but only if she didn't wish him dead. Lydia asks why the little sister in particular, and Darbury replies that he doesn't think he would have thought the little brother was cute. He adds that he wouldn't think the older brother was cute either, and he has to think about the older sister. Lydia says that she seems to have just heard blatantly prejudicial and discriminatory remarks, but Darbury doesn't see it as a big deal because they don't even exist. Lydia asks why he thinks his little sister is cute. He replies that first of all she is his sister, so she looks like him and is very beautiful. In addition, she is talented, smart, dexterous, but not arrogant, and also modest. Her character is kind and fair, she favours the weak and is strict with the strong. Though she is careful in everything she does, sometimes she unexpectedly shows her not-so-good side. She is skillful at setting boundaries when dealing with strangers, and is always nice to her only older brother. Lydia asks if it is all Darbury's fantasy, to which the latter, not understanding, asks what kind of fantasy. The girl replies that anyone who would listen to him would say it was all fantasy. The knight says that he has been waiting for someone to ask him about it, and has kept these thoughts in his heart. Lydia wonders how he put up with it all this time. Radbury replies that it's not fair. He was only describing a very real image of his sister based on existing factors. Lydia turns to him, saying that she found something on the floor of the mansion, and it seems to be his conscience. Lydia thinks that for a while she has even forgotten, since she hasn't seen him in almost a year. But Darbury really is that kind of person. Suddenly, the knight asks the girl what she thinks about it, how important family is to her. The girl comes to think about it, because if you think about it, she is also an orphan, she has no blood relatives in this mansion. And even if her real family exists somewhere, she will still never know about it. As a robot, Lydia replies that family is as important to her as heaven and earth, which leaves Darbury shocked, asking if it was possible to answer like that. Darbury adds that although he doesn't have a little sister, he has someone who has been replacing her, even if he is the only one who thinks so. The girl thinks it's a declaration of love. He just thinks of her as his little sister and doesn't know how to respond, but replies that she will know how he feels someday. Suddenly, Lydia asks the knight how that girl is a person, to which he replies that he thinks that all of the above fits her description in many ways. The girl remembers about that imaginary little sister and asks herself if she even exists. Suddenly, Darbury informs her that she is a real person but Lydia replies that she never said anything. Darbury and the girl reach her room, which she reports. Lydia, standing at the door, says she heard that Darbury was ordered not to leave her side for a moment and asks if he will follow her to her room. Darbury replies that the exceptions are places with guaranteed security or personal use, so he will not go in. Lydia asks if the knight can rest while she's in the room, but Darbury hasn't even considered it, to which the girl tells him to rest. If she's going to go out anywhere, she will call him, to which Darbury agrees. Going into her room, Lydia immediately lies down on her bed. She thinks about laying out all her stuff, but she doesn't feel like moving at all. The reason she came back to her room was because she needed to take apart the suitcase hidden in her closet and put it in order. She had originally wanted to take it with her when she was going to run away, but the situation had changed a bit 
and she wouldn't be able to do that right now. The girl thinks she will rest a little and get started. Time passes and suddenly someone wakes Lydia up, addressing her. The girl gets up and doesn't realise how much time has passed and asks what happened. Lydia is informed that Lady Grace wants to meet with her. Walking to Ares, Lydia thinks they broke up with a greeter in the dining room. The worst assumptions popped into her head. She worried if a greeter would be killed by the damn world as she left her alone. But fortunately it didn't happen, and the girl thinks that Ari has made a decision. To live or die. And her fate also depends on this choice. Lydia came into the room, sitting down on the chair opposite a greeter. Suddenly, a downcast a greeter turns to Lydia and asks her if she thinks she's dead, which leaves the girl shocked. A greeter says that it wasn't a greeter Grace who died, but she, Ari, who slipped on the stairs there. After Lydia's story, she thought a lot. The girl said that after death, her soul can return to the original world. And if this is really true, then doesn't that mean she died in the original world? And that's why her soul moved to this one. Suddenly, Ari starts to have tears that fall right down her arms. She reports that that staircase was quite tall. She didn't want to think about it, but it was indeed very tall. Beginning to wipe her tears with her hands, she asks Lydia if she is really dead, because she is only 17 years old, has not yet passed the entrance exams, has not entered the university, and had many plans for the winter vacation. The girl does not hold back her tears and informs that she does not want to die. Lydia, who sits in shock, thinks that she doesn't want to die either. After her birth in this world, she only remembered her past life as a hazy past, so she was indifferent. If she was in the same situation, she would feel the same way. A time when there are many things you haven't done, when you look forward to your future life, more than indulging in memories of the days you've already lived. It's a great age for her. Lydia thinks Ari is too young to deal with the sudden death that has descended upon her. As she hugs Agrita, the girl thinks that it wasn't Agrita who was comforted in her arms for a long time, but a crying 17-year-old Shin Ari who didn't want to die. Some time passes. The girls sit across from each other again. Lydia says that she relies on Ari, to which Ari agrees. Ari decides to continue living as a greeter Grace. Lydia thinks that she had no other choice in this situation, even if she can come back. There is a high probability that her original body is dead. And if she dies here and can't come back, she will just end her life with a useless death. Lydia decides to help Ari survive and she in turn decides to help her escape. Suddenly, Ari says she really doesn't understand. She doesn't understand how someone as kind as Lydia could be killed. Ari calls Ash a bad villain. Ari informs him that she will do everything she can for Lydia's safe escape. She will charm the villain with her skillful seduction skills. Lydia wonders if Ari will be able to properly utilize her seduction skills. They have a bigger problem, even if Ari uses her skill, will it work on Ash? Lydia recalls her brother asking her if she liked to greet a Grace and suggesting she make a doll of her. Ash's indifferent voice rang out in her head, not wavering for a second. Lydia thinks that the fact that Ash followed Ari last night to help her, the fact that he didn't hesitate to save her from drowning in the pond without saying a word. She saw hope in those two acts, but it's just useless optimism. Ash was indifferent. Lydia realises it's common knowledge, but a greeter is beautiful. White skin with a peachy red blush and neat facial features. A slender build that makes you want to take her under her protection. Long, smooth hair, clear and lustrous eyes. Elegant, pure and innocent. An attractive appearance that, once seen once, is hard to forget. Lydia, setting her mug of tea on a saucer, thinks about how she should use it all. She thinks Ash doesn't look at a person's appearance. His lack of interest in other people means he has no interest in their appearance either. Ash never showed any interest in beauties or those who were not. Instead, regardless of their appearance, he treated everyone equally. Lydia thinks this was one of the factors that increased Ash's popularity with the girls. She thinks that people find it very attractive to not judge others based on looks. She needs another way to get Ash's attention. She approaches Ari and tells her to try harder, to which she happily agrees. She actively supported the red-haired girl's offer of mutual aid. Thanks to that, the girl would be able to try to survive. If it wasn't for Ari, 
She wouldn't know who she would tell about her miserable future and who she would talk to about what to do next. And there's something more important than seduction, and that aim the rest is only possible if Ari stays alive. Exactly, Ari's tire is alive. So the girl's first task is to rewrite the unfortunate fate and make sure Ari stays alive. The girl with red hair told Ari to follow her. Ari said she understood. The girl with red hair had some things to check, but for that, Ari would have to face danger once more. But at the same time, the girl couldn't let her suffer. By putting Ari's life in danger, it was necessary to help this girl survive. And to do that, Sir Danbury was absolutely necessary. Sir Danbury hugged Ari and said there were no casualties. That's pretty much what you'd expect from a sir. Just then, a flower pot almost fell on Ari's head, but Sir Danbury saved her. It was 15 minutes past one on the clock. Lydia asked Ari if she was all right. The girl replied that she was fine. Afterward, Lydia thanked Sir for his help. The boy was embarrassed and said he shouldn't talk about it. Ari and Sir Danbury both looked scared. Anticipating danger and facing it head-on are different things. And Sir had already saved Ari's life twice in one day. The girl with the red hair wanted to take the opportunity, while Sir Dunbury stepped away. Before she could leave, she told Ari not to leave her tonight, because she needed to see it all before dinner, before she could say anything. Ari understood. There's a ringing from the other room. The maid knelt down and apologised to Sir Danbury. The boy said it was all right. What a lot of victims there were of the manifestation of the world trying to kill Ari. The girl with red hair calmed the maid down and told her it was okay. Ari answered her the same. During the four-day coming-of-age ceremony and birthday banquet, the second day of the celebration was beginning. The girl had completely forgotten about it, for she had spent the whole time with Agrita without leaving her side. But afterward Bessie came in, and the girl was caught up in a sudden fancy. After a while, the girl asked Sir Danbury for his opinion, for the girl felt no sincerity in his answer. Jokingly, the guy started telling the girl that they were very dazzling and that it was hard for him to even look at them because he didn't want to be dazzled. The girl and Arya were very happy with this answer. The girl assumed everything, but for unknown reasons, Essie still hadn't come down to the banquet hall, and if he was going to attend, he would have come early to escort the girl. Therefore, there was a high probability that he would not show up. Usually the celebration was held over several days, but Essie often only showed up on the first day, and according to the book, he should have been present today too, to show interest in Agrita. Then he would get rid of the two young men who asked Agrita to dance. But it would be funny if Essie followed the plot of the book. It was half past seven on the clock. Already, a lot of things had been going wrong from the beginning. Nothing had happened since the flower pot incident. It was already slowly approaching time for a new threat to Ari's life. Lydia had no way of knowing what the girl might be waiting for. Lydia removed everything from the banquet hall that could threaten Ari's life. And Ari won't go outside to risk it now either, like she did yesterday. After a while, some guy was already approaching Lydia. He was complimenting the girl on how dazzling she looked. Lydia thanked the guy for the compliments but later asked him who he was. The guy answered the girl that he had already introduced himself to her last time, but she didn't seem to remember him. The guy said that he was the eldest son of Count Gami, Rig Gami, and he was honoured to meet Lydia. The girl remembered Mr Gami and told him that she was happy to see him too. The gentleman began to tell Lydia that there was no way he could see the Duke today. Lydia answered the lad that Essie was busy with business today. After a while, Lydia and Mr. Gami were already having a nice conversation. The Lord told the girl that being the head of a family was not easy. He said that if you took even him, the successor classes alone were tedious. Lydia listened attentively to the boy and smiled sweetly. She didn't know who he was, and she didn't think she would remember him if she met him next time. The gentleman approached the girl and asked her if she would like a glass of wine. Lydia was already reaching for the glass, when someone shouted not to drink it and tossed the glass aside. Mr. Gami looked to the side and looked for the person who had tossed the glass aside. It was the lady, Dianda. The bodymaster asked the girl what she was doing and why she did that. The girl was very angry with Mr. Gami and asked him what he was going to do. Lady Dianda knew that the boy had put poison in the glass, 
All the people who were in the hall were shocked by this information. Mr. Gammy told the girl that he didn't know what he was talking about and he didn't do anything. Lady Da Anda was angry at the guy for going to use the same method as last time. She was angry at the people who had gathered in the hall and were acting like nothing happened. Mr. Gami said it was a misunderstanding and he was only helping a drunk girl. Mr. Gami said it was all a misunderstanding and everyone had misunderstood. The guy didn't like the fact that he was being treated like that. Lady Daanda said he was being treated like this because he was adding wine to the poison. Mr. Gami was still saying that it was a lie and his mistake was not to know that she had a bad tolerance for alcohol and let her abuse it, but he couldn't understand why everyone thought he was adding poison. Mr. Gami told Lady Daanda that she understands that the girl is her friend, but he also added that these accusations are unfair. Lydia couldn't understand what was going on. From the expression on Mr. Gami's face, it was hard to tell that he was lying, but the time was slowly approaching. The boy who was standing next to Lydia asked Lady Daanda if she knew what might have been spiked. Lady Daanda answered that she did not know what it was called, but she only knew what the effect was after such use. The body becomes weak and memory is partially lost. Daanda said that if she had not discovered her friend in time, it would have been frightening to imagine the trouble she might have gotten into. Mr. Gami shouted and said that Lady Daanda was brazenly lying. The boy asked everyone to calm down and suggested that they seek help. By asking for help, the guy meant getting to know Essie. Besides, Essie had a lot of guys behind her. Essie approached Lydia and asked if she was okay. The girl said she was fine. Essie replied to the guy that everything had already been reported to him. The guy apologised for disturbing and inconveniencing Essie. Essie replied to the guy that it wasn't his fault. Lydia couldn't understand who all these people he brought. Some guys who were with Mr. Gammy told Essie that he didn't know what was wrong, but said he was wrong and asked to be spared. Essie told the guys that he wanted to ask them something. He asked them if they remembered all the types of substances sold and their buyers. Everyone began to think about it. Sir Danbury replied that all the people standing there were selling drugs that were currently working. Lydia couldn't understand how they had found them so quickly and brought them in. One of the guys who was begging for mercy started talking about a man doing a deal about a week ago, and the person who bought the drugs from him was Mr. Gami. Mr. Gami was very angry and wanted to attack everyone. Essie started asking the guys about the type of drug and its effects. A guy answered that it was colourless and odourless, slightly bitter to the taste, and if you add it to alcohol or a drink, you can hardly taste it. After a certain time, after ingestion, the body temperature rises and the strength leaves the person. The day after ingestion, the person loses their memory. Lydia realised that the lady was telling the truth. Mr. Gami was angry and asked for proof. He told Essie that even if he bought the poison from this guy, they had no proof that the poison was in the glass, and he would have poisoned the girl. The master replied that he had bought the poison at one request. He didn't use it, so it wasn't his fault. Lydia noted the fact that for a guy who had just tried to escape, he didn't lack confidence. Essie asked the guy who sold the poison to the gentleman to distinguish the substance in the drink. Essie asked if the guy could do it if there was little substance added to the drink. The fellow replied that he could do it because he himself had dealt with it. And after a while, he began to creep toward the broken glass. The guy dipped his finger in the wine and gave a taste. After a while, the guy said he was sure it was a love potion. Essie looked at the boy in surprise. He couldn't understand what this potion was or what it was for. Some girl in the crowd started talking about what she had heard about the love potion. Essie asked if it was true. The girl replied that she thought it was real and wanted to purchase it, but she didn't know that it happened to be such a drug. She was very happy that such a handy thing really existed. The girl replied that if there was a drug that forcibly made a person fall in love, she would. But before the girl could say anything, Lydia screamed. No one could understand why the girl was screaming and everyone was surprised by it. Lydia screamed at Ari to run away, but it was too late. Mr. Gammy came up behind the girl and put a knife under her throat. Lydia yelled at the guy for what he was doing. Master told everyone that no one knew it would turn out like this. Master asked for something from Essie. He asked for a promise to Essie that today's incident would not affect him or his family in any way. Lydia didn't understand why Mr. Gummy wanted to take a man hostage. 
since there were so many witnesses in the room. The girl understood that the boy was cornered, but still. Lydia had no way of knowing why Ari was the one. Lydia screamed at Sir Danbury and asked him why he didn't protect her. Sir was protecting Lydia first and foremost. The girl knew this, but she still persisted. Mr Gammy asked only for his word that he and his family would be all right. Lydia realised that if this continued, even if the guy just pretended to swipe the knife, he might mistakenly swipe the knife for real and accidentally kill Ari. The girl was curious, of course, to find out what kind of danger the girl was in, but she didn't want to find out that way. Essie started to ask Lydia if he could save Ari. Lydia shouted yes clearly and loudly. Essie began to slowly approach Mr Gami. All the action was happening too fast and Lydia couldn't understand anything. She saw Mr Gami with a wounded wrist and a knife lying on the floor. Ari ran up to Lydia and shouted to her that she had survived. Essie stood next to Mr Gami and told his aides to hand the man over to the... Lydia shouted yes clearly and loudly. Essie began to slowly approach Mr Gami. All the action was happening too fast and Lydia couldn't understand anything. She saw Mr Gami with a wounded wrist and a knife lying on the floor. Ari ran up to Lydia and shouted... Thanks to Mr Gami, the girl remembered something. It was certainly not a love potion, but it could be used to win Essie's heart. Lydia stood next to Sir Danbury and told him that it wasn't worth going that far. Briefly about what happened in the banquet hall some time ago. All the girls began to ask Ari if she was all right, for this Mr Gami was a terrible person. Everyone was glad that everything was over and nothing happened. People in the banquet hall came up to Lydia and chatted non-stop. It was like they were at the girls' autograph session. Thanks to Sir Danbury's iron boundary, any man, regardless of age, couldn't even come close to Lydia. Even if a little boy came up who had a look in his eye that said he wanted to greet the lady, you couldn't go. Sir Danbury kept everyone away from Lydia saying it was an order. And so it was all about Essie. Lydia was sitting in her room, reading a book and looking for something in it. The book said that three gods existed in this world the god of time, the god of love, and the god of destruction. There was also a temple prepared for the goddesses to worship the god of time. There were beads that turned back time. A shawl of enchantment was prepared in the temple worshipping the god of love. The book said that traditionally other people should not hate the goddess. They should be loved by everyone. And in this they would be helped by a gift prepared by them. It was a shawl of enchantment. If people wore it, then everyone who saw the people would begin to feel more than sympathy for them. A feeling of longing from members of the same sex and love from members of the opposite sex. And the attachment between family and friends will grow even deeper. Lydia talked about how it was the treasure of the temple worshipping the god of love, and the girl only needs to steal it. Then Ari can conquer Essie. Why did the girl remember it now? There was a good reason. First of all, Agrita didn't use the shawl of enchantment because everyone loved her without the shawl, even those who were jealous of her, who were influenced by her good heart, eventually fell in love with her. Even without the aid of the shawl of enchantment, Agrita was loved by all. The effectiveness of the shawl was great, but the wearer didn't have much use for it. But the most important reason is that the main character of the book, Agrita's lover. The crown prince knew of the shawl's existence and, supposedly by accident, burned it. Then he didn't hesitate to get rid of the temple's precious gift in one day. In attitude, she and Ash were very similar. That's why the shawl of enchantment was barely mentioned in the book. But anyway, Lydia decided to steal the shawl of enchantment and give it to Ari. Actually, it's not as easy as it seems, and Lydia didn't know if she could do it. The girl realised that since it was a temple, the structure was likely to be similar, and the way in which the treasure was hidden was probably the same. And besides, Lydia has the book. Lydia prayed to God to make the theft succeed this time. Lydia realised that stealing was wrong, but she was doing it to survive, and the girl hoped the Lord would take notice. So the girl spent the night stirring her heart, along with unabashed prayer. The girl woke up with the thought that she would steal the shawl of enchantment from the temple of love, and if Ari succeeded in charming Ash with it, she would use the opportunity to escape from her villainous brother. If it were the girl's will, she would steal the shawl right now and run away from here. But she can't recklessly visit the temple where the god of love is worshipped. A prior request had to be sent, 
and permission had to be granted if the donation did not exceed a certain amount. Lydia realised they would not give permission, but she wrote the letter anyway and gave it to the butler, and later added to him to give it to the temple. The butler asked Lydia if she was going to go there. The girl said she was going there. The butler thought about the girl's words and was shocked by them, for he knew that Lydia hated temples. Lydia replied that it was just a hurricane of rage, seized by resentment at the miserable fate of her past life. The girl was telling the butler that it wasn't that she hated temples directly, it was just that Lydia had developed an interest in a temple that worshipped the god of love. She told the butler that the god of love was very romantic. Butler replied that Lydia had once told him that God was definitely a selfish narcissist who loved only himself. Lydia asked him to forget it. At the time, the girl hadn't been arrested for hating God, even after all her insults towards him. The girl looked at the time and saw that it was already lunchtime and she had to go. It was all thanks to her status. Lydia was sitting at the table as a huge snake began to crawl near her. Sir Danbury asked the girl if she was always so unlucky, for it had been several times during the day. The snake had appeared while Ari and Lydia were eating lunch, and while stealthily heading for Ari's ankle, was caught by Sir Danbury and cut in two. And the same thing happened this morning. Rama almost fell on Ari's head. And the one who saved her from that was Sir Danbury. The girl had been told that this year would be a year of exceptionally bad luck. Lydia asked Ari if that was true. The girl laughed and said it was. Sir Danbury was telling the girls that they should be careful. And afterward, Lydia said she wanted to ask Sir Danbury something about whether anyone else could quite have handled it but him. It's just that the snake had crept up very stealthily. So much so that Lydia and Ari only noticed her when Sir Danbury killed her. Sir started to say no because she was only able to be caught because it was Sir Danbury. If there was an ordinary knight here, he would have probably pulled out his sword after the snake had bitten his target. Lydia asked the guy about the guy wanting to say he was unusual. Sir Danbury told the girl that he is, for he is Danbury Sack. At first glance it sounds like a joke, but it's actually true. Danbury Sack is one of the most talented of the Widgreen family. In terms of sword skills, rumour has it that if only Sir Danbury had a different background, he would have taken a leadership position in the Imperial Palace. But what was more important? It was that Essie was the one who took him simply for his talent, regardless of any factors. There was no need to talk about his skills after all. Sir Danbury was able to catch that snake. But back then, Lydia had no way of knowing who would be able to save Ari when he was gone. If saving Ari is such a difficult task, then even if many attendants pester her, their skills won't be enough. Ari will die, and then everything will be in vain. Albeit a little later than the girl's expectation that the reply would arrive within a day, but it arrived the day after the end of the four-day celebration, so it was just in time. As soon as Lydia received the letter, she quickly began to get ready. She got into the carriage and headed straight for the temple, before leaving. There was no way Lydia could forget and explain their plan to Ari. Sir Danbury sat next to the girls and told them that that fellow Mr Gammy had been kicked out of the family. Lydia didn't realise who he was talking about at first. Ari was very happy that such a criminal was kicked out of the family. She wondered what would happen to him. The boy replied that this man was now no different from a commoner. He was originally the son of a count, so he was a nobleman, but had no title. In such a situation, in the case of breaking off his relationship with his family, the Gami surname would completely disappear from his life. Lydia told Ari that he had lost his family name, so now he was no different from a commoner. But to do that, everyone had to really decisively cut all ties. Just telling him to leave won't work. You have to destroy the kinship certificate in front of everyone. Expulsion from the family must be documented and notarised by the Imperial Palace. This makes it impossible to admit him back into the family later. So it rarely happens in an aristocratic society where blood decides everything. Lydia realised that it seems Count Nami had made a firm decision. Sir Danbury realised that it would be very wise if he sheltered the criminal, then they would all die together. She felt that it was not a wise choice. The girl had some sort of evil premonition. Come to think of it, Lydia heard Essie going out yesterday. The girl thought that he probably just had some business to attend to, and Lydia didn't give it any special meaning. 
But the girl thought about it and thought about what if he actually went to Count Gami's house and threatened him. Ari and Lydia were talking about something. Aria said it was refreshing, like soda. Lydia replied that it was really like drinking soda, even though what this criminal was going to do to the girl was just an attempt. It looked like something he had taught more than once and more than twice. Ari asked Lydia if they had a long way to go. The girl answered Ari that it was most likely a long drive ahead of them. Ari was starting to get carsick. Lilia understood and said something about waking the girl up when they arrived. As soon as Ari's head touched the back of the chair, she fell asleep. Sir so Danbury asked Lydia if she had ever been to the Temple of Love. The girl replied that she had never been. It was also the first time for Lydia. Sir said he didn't remember much about visiting temples. Sir so Danbury said he once didn't believe in gods at all. It was another story from the dark past. Lilia asked the lad if it had been a long time ago and how they came to faith. The guy replied that in a way things have changed and gotten better now. The guy says that when hopelessness takes over and hope is gone, there are doubts about the existence of gods. Perhaps the meeting between Darbury and Ash was the key moment that changed his faith. Lydia smiled and said she understood. The carriage climbed onto a rock and began to shake. No one realised what was happening. Ari was screaming and talking about what was happening. Lydia almost bit her tongue off. So Danbury began to ask Lydia if she was all right. The girl said she was fine. So Danbury did not realise what was happening outside. They were in the woods. So Danbury asked the girls if they were going the right way. Lydia assumed they weren't. The lad decided to ask the coachman where they were going, but Lydia wouldn't let him get out and said she would go herself. The coachman was going the wrong way, the girl decided to shout to him, not knowing if he would hear. The boy heard nothing. Lydia wondered what was wrong with him. The coachman was telling himself a tray about how by living as a beggar he would not die alone and they would die together. He was saying that he would take it with him to his grave. The girl realised that the coachman seemed to be crazy and was driving the carriage to an unknown destination. Lydia decided to find out what time it was. But before she could understand anything, the girls began to have a headache. Lydia cracked the balloon and found herself in a room in the kitchen. Ari sat on a chair and looked at Lydia. The girl had no way of understanding what was going on with Lydia. Sir Danbury didn't understand what was going on with the girl either. Lydia was back in the dining hall for the day and the girl's gums still hurt. Ari asked Lydia if she was okay. The girl said she was fine and she decided to go to her room. Lydia thought it was a nightmare because she saw the cliff when the carriage tilted. The girl realised that they had almost died and almost gone to the other world. Lydia had always lived on her intuition. The girl had no way of understanding what was going on and death really could have taken them into its arms. It was quite expected to realise that something was going to happen to Ari, but with Darbury by her side, Lydia remained calm. In any case, the girl had no way of knowing that the coachman would go mad, much less decide to kill himself and them by driving off a cliff. Now Lydia looked differently at her intuition and realised that whatever is done is all for the best. The girl only wanted to live quietly in peace. She could not panic, for the main thing was caution. Lydia stood talking to the boy. She appointed him as a coachman, but the guy could not understand why it was him. The girl understood that Alex was young, healthy, and of all the servants, he was the most executive. In general... He was the main candidate who does not cause trouble. Lydia replied to the guy that she had a wide heart and trusted the guy, so the guy would be her coachman. Alex was glad that they couldn't find anyone more reliable. The guy was always open and so good-natured. He didn't seem to know the word discouragement. Lydia relied on the boy and Alex told the girl he wouldn't let her down. Night fell. Lydia began to feel uneasy and had a bad feeling. To be sure, the girl put Darbury next to Alex and brought the knights to ride with them in the carriage. Ari asked Lydia if she was nervous. The girl answered that she was a little nervous, and also the girl slid the curtains to see everything that was happening outside and took a watch to count down the time. Lydia realised that now she would definitely not miss anything. The carriage drove off, but after a while it stopped. Lydia did not understand what was the matter, the coachman answered that there was a man on the road. After a while, Darbury came to the carriage and said that a child got in the way of the carriage. 
and then he started screaming and asking for help. Ari did not realise what was happening. The child looked to be ten years old, dirty and shabby. Lydia realised that his appearance was just screaming for help, but they had to keep going. Ari looked at Lydia and waited for his response. The girl looked at Ari and Darbury and told the coachman to touch. Under normal circumstances, Lydia would have gone out to the boy without a second thought. But now it was different. The girl didn't know what would happen this time. Lydia looked at the time and it showed 12.30. Everyone started calling for Lydia, but the girl told everyone to hurry up. A lot of guys came up to the boy and called him a little rascal. The boy said that the boy was right and the noble's carriage would definitely show up here, but that they just had to wait for it. The boy said that he had kept his word and asked them not to attack his village. No one could figure out who these people were. Darbury thought they were brigands. Lydia realised they were in trouble. Sir Danbury wanted to call this abnormal situation and laughed. Everyone asked how many brigands there were and someone said 20, if not more. And after a while, more began to pull up to them. The coachman began to talk about how whatever happened, they had to be ready to die. Lydia called Sir Darbury and asked him if they could stop the men. The boy told Lydia not to worry, and if the carriage turned around now, it would quickly make its way to the nearest outpost of guards, and Sir Darbury would hold them off all the while, even at the cost of his own life. The girl realised that Sir's words were not empty words and their gaze was full of no resolve. The girl hoped that the bead would help save Ari. After a while, the girl found herself in her chambers again. Lydia realised that there was no way to go out with Ari in the current situation. At first, it seemed to the girl that these troubles were happening because she was not careful enough. Lydia thought that if she organised everything carefully, she would be able to calm down. It took two beads to realise that it wasn't worth leaving the manor. Unlike the usual robbers, these were far more numerous and outnumbered no matter how you looked at it. Getting into such a difficult situation wasn't just an unfortunate coincidence, Lily began to think. She realised that within the house, all the problems were rather minor, like broken vases and picture frames. When Ari was in the square, however, she was confronted with much more serious incidents, namely the clock tower falling and the explosion. There was no way Lydia could think of anything. She regretted that the price of that knowledge was two whole beads. And this time the girl was upset not because of that, but because if they went somewhere together again, there would be another collapse. Lydia had no choice but to leave Ari and go to the temple herself, but no one realised who would protect her from the dangers of the manor. Lydia realised that even if she could choose a shawl, Ari might die in the hours of the girl's absence, and then everything would be in vain. Nevertheless, it would not do to trust Ari to any ordinary servant, and Sir Darbury would follow Lydia but the girl still needed to try and talk him down. Sir Danbury shouted to the girl that it was impossible. Lydia knew the lad would say so and began to plead with him. Sir Darbury spoke of being killed if he disobeyed orders and did Lydia this favour. The boy couldn't understand why they wanted to go to the temple apart. Sir Darbury spoke of how no one had as much talent as he did and especially no one had as much power. The girl said that's what she meant. Lydia was saying that the lad had outstanding abilities and he should protect Ari at the manor. Sir Darbury spoke of his primary duty to protect Lydia. Guy suggested asking someone else to look after Ari. Lydia replied that she couldn't do that and that's why she was asking Sir Darbury. It wasn't as if there were no other knights on the estate who could match Darbury's strength, though there were a few somewhere. The girl understood that such gifted individuals were entrusted with jobs appropriate to their level, so there was no way Lydia could ask them to watch over Ari. If it was Ash's order, then they would have obeyed. The girl thought for a long time and realised that she only had the last option left. Lydia didn't say anything to the guy and started to walk away quickly. The easiest and most obvious way to solve this problem was to go to Ash. However, it had become difficult to ask him for anything since some time. The problem wasn't him. Ash always offered to help him on his own, never even having to talk about it. Lydia felt more and more awkward every time Ash helped him and fulfilled his every whim. That was the problem. Lydia herself had realised that recently. Eventually, all of his concern would evaporate when he found out the truth and realising that, 
only brought bitterness and anger. Lydia stood next to the servant. He greeted the girl and asked what she needed. The girl replied that she wanted to talk to Ash alone. The servant said he understood the girl and asked her to wait a second. The servant told Ash that his Miss Lydia was here to see him. Ash opened the door and asked a girl to come in. Afterwards, he asked her what was the matter. The girl asked him something to ask if the guy was free. Ash said that he will do everything even if he is busy. Afterward, he offered to have tea. Lydia said no. The girl was thinking what better to say, for she couldn't directly state that she wanted to steal the shawl of enchantment from the Temple of Love, but she was leaving Ari at home, for her life was in danger, so she should be looked after by someone who would provide protection in Lydia's absence. She thinks that if she asked Sir Darbury to do so, she would be refused, because Darbury does not obey her orders, but ashes. After thinking about it, Lydia tells her brother that she needs to go to the Temple of Love for a while, so she hopes for his help in finding a distinguished knight to take care of Ari while she is away. Ash asks her sister how outstanding a knight should be, and Lydia, after thinking about it, replies that as Sir Darbury. Lydia wonders if she needs to explain more about the requirements, or if such a gifted person would simply not agree to such an assignment. Ash looks at Lydia in silence and thinks. He replies that if she wants someone like Darbury, he will do it, which surprises the girl. Ash says that Sir Darbury will stay at the manor and he will go with Lydia. Lydia hesitates, looking at her brother's desk, which is littered with papers, and asks if he's not busy. But Ash, placing his mug of tea on the table, repeats that it doesn't matter. Lydia has to go on a trip for the third time with Ash. Outside, the couple is seen off by Knight Darbury, who waves his handkerchief. Lydia rushes at him and asks him if he is being polite himself now, for at first he refused and said he would not change his mind. Darbury replies that there is a heaven above them all, whose decisions they have no right to discuss, and as punishment, he is willing to say Lydia's name any number of times. The girl thinks Ash is an asshole. Sitting in the carriage, she tells her brother to climb in, and once seated, she says goodbye to everyone and asks Darbury to take care of Ari, to which he replies to let Lydia rely on him. Sitting in the carriage opposite each other, Lydia and Ash are silent. The girl thinks that his desk was piled with papers, and the sooner they return, the better. Lydia has a feeling as if the coachman is driving the carriage as gently as possible, without shaking. She gets the impression as if the carriage is moving too calmly. She realises that it's not her imagination, and it's just the way it is because Ash is here. Lydia looks at her brother and thinks he is tall and strong, with perfect facial features without a single flaw. It's hard for people to stay calm around Ash, even if they don't know who he is. Lydia wonders what would have happened if they hadn't known each other, and their first meeting had happened on the day of the ceremony. She suggests that she would have been frightened, she thinks that if the madness had remained a secret to her, the interaction might have been much more pleasant, but she knows the truth and drives those thoughts away. Suddenly, Ash catches Lydia's eye and wonders if she has something she wants to say to him. She asks her brother, worriedly, if he has now visited the Temple of Love, to which he replies in the negative. The girl realises that this is his first trip and the Western Love Temple is a pretty famous place. She wonders Ash if he's interested in seeing it. Ash replies that he is more interested in what draws Lydia there. Lydia replies that she just wants to admire the view, to which Ash agrees and closes his eyes again. Looking at him, Lydia thinks he looks tired, judging from his closed eyes. She realises that despite being tired, he still decided to ride along with her. She decides that she won't look for deep meaning in this. And as it is, the ride is very comfortable. Time passes and the carriage stops right outside the temple. Lydia wakes up abruptly, thinking she hadn't noticed she had fallen asleep. She doesn't realise how much time she slept. The couple gets out of the carriage. Lydia, looking at the facade of the Western Temple of Love, marvels at the beautiful view. She thinks that it appears to be a quick and easy way to get to the temple. She wonders how Ari is doing. As she walks up the steps to the temple, Lydia is greeted by the attendant of the Western Love Temple. Lydia introduces herself and introduces her brother. The attendant replies that she has heard a lot about them. 
The attendant informs her that the rumours were true and Lydia and Ash are indeed very beautiful. But Lydia doesn't understand why the attendant is then only looking at her brother. She thinks that, in any case, Operation Shawl Kidnapping has begun. The attendant tells the couple that their temple was built about 300 years ago at the behest of the priest, in charge at the time by the Zazia brothers, considered the best architects of the time. Lydia realises that it is just as she thought. She was worried because the exterior of the temple looks somewhat different, while the interior arrangement is the same as the temple of the time. In that case, the location of the right room would be the same. A secret place, hidden inside the room where the higher cleric stayed. And there is the shawl of enchantment. She had definitely read the passage in the book that told how to get the shawl. Lydia thinks it would be easy enough to get her if the method of storage is the same as the beads. All she needs to do is infiltrate the room of the higher ministers. The temple was built thanks to the believers, so she doesn't think there will be any guards near the right room. The girl thinks that, of course there won't be any guards there, and the main thing is not to make noise. She will be invisible like a ghost, so no one will see her. The couple along with the attendant go inside the temple. When they reach the door of the room, they stop. The minister replies that this is the small prayer room. Here they can leave their offering and pray to God. When they have finished praying, she will show them one by one the small auditorium, the large auditorium, the reception area, and the large prayer room. The minister would like to take them to the large prayer room first, but the high priest is praying there now. Lydia inquires about this. The minister replies that if they wish to observe him, she will warn the high priest about it. A surprised Lydia replies that she should not and thanks the minister for her concern. Lydia realises this is a chance. If the high priest is praying now, then the room she needs is empty. She asks the minister what she will do while she and Ash are in the small prayer room. The minister replies that she has no right to interfere with their prayer, so she will wait for them in the hallway. Lydia agrees with her. Arriving at the small prayer room, Lydia wonders how she can slip away. She needs to rush out of here, get to the high priest's room, quickly get her shawl and go back in. But if she goes out into the hallway, it won't work. She needs a place where she can't be tracked. She thinks about going out the window and looks at Ash. Lydia informs him that she needs to go somewhere for a while and she's quick. She wonders if Ash will wait for her, but he replies that he'll go with her. After climbing out the window, the couple crawls under the windows. Lydia thinks it wasn't that hard to find the high servant's room, because the inner workings are the same as the temple of time she recently stole from. Whoever built them was like hitting the copy and paste button. After getting past all the obstacles, the couple successfully makes it to the high servant's room. Lydia informs Ash that they're there. When she gets to the shelf, she thinks she needs to push on it to open the secret space. Ash helps his sister push the shelf, for which she thanks him. A secret room opens up with a pink chest inside. Lydia thinks that this chest must be where the shawl of enchantment is kept. This moment is similar to when she kidnapped the time beads. Looking at Lydia, Ash chuckles, saying it looks funny, but the girl doesn't realise what's wrong. She thinks it doesn't matter right now, and there are things much more important. She thinks that at first glance, the chest may seem ordinary, but in fact it has a divine power attached to it. You can't just open it. There is a magic that only allows it to open if the letters that make up the password are right. Lydia thinks this is familiar to her, for it reminds her of unlocking a cell phone. She assumes the cipher is the same as the one used in the Temple of Time. The god honoured in this temple is Asimor, the god of love. Having entered the signs, Lydia thinks that when the signs disappear, the chest should open. But suddenly the cipher panel lights up red and starts beeping which startles Lydia. The girl realises that at this rate they will be caught. She doesn't understand how the password could be wrong, since the book said it was unconditionally correct to use the name of the deity worshipped at the temple. Suddenly the chest stops beeping. Lydia thinks it is fortunate that the alarm has gone off, but she has no idea what the cipher might be other than the name of the god. Time passes. Lydia has entered the names of all the love gods she knows, However, nothing fits. She thinks that if the alarm sounds again, they might get caught. Suddenly, there is a sound from the other side that startles Lydia. She grabs Ash's hand and tells him to hide quickly. In their haste, 
They had to hide behind the catwalk, but she is glad that she has closed the entrance again with a bookshelf. On the other side are two guards who are looking for the cause of the sound. One guard says that the sound definitely came from here. He says that if he didn't mishear it, the intruders may have already fled. The knights are going to go look around. Lydia is already relaxing, but suddenly one guard opens a secret room and asks if anyone is here. But he realises that there can't be, because only a few people know about this place, and then leaves. Lydia realises that this time the guards are definitely gone. This time the irreparable could have happened. As she stands up, Lydia catches her dress and falls right on top of Ash. Ash wonders if his sister is okay, but Lydia remains silent. She realises Ash is so close to her and doesn't understand why her heart is pounding so much. She assumes it's still the tension from the recent shocks. Lydia was almost lying on top of Ash and staring into his eyes. The guy called out to her. The girl took both hands on the guy's face and told herself about how this couldn't be happening. She said something about not the god of love, but liar, the god of beauty. And afterwards she asked Ash how he felt about it. After a while, Lydia got it, and it was the right password, for it was a temple worshipping the god of love. And afterward, Lydia asked if they should be punished for blasphemy. The nun couldn't take her eyes off Essie's face, which made Lydia think that beauty was a gift from God. So she decided to try that option. But nothing changed. It was striking to Lydia that beauty came before love. She was surprised that appearance was so important. And anyway, she had realised it back when she was talking about the monetary offerings. Ash asked Lydia if she had everything. The girl took a shawl of charms from her trunk and told him they could go. They returned home without any problems. Lilia started to ask for Ash's jacket. The guy gave her his jacket, and in it the girl hid the shawl of enchantment. Ash looked at Lydia and told her that if she only wanted the shawl, she could have said so back at the manor and she would have just stolen it. The girl wondered how he would do it. Lydia could not imagine that Ash would be able to commit the theft in the same way she had. In his case, after stealing the shawl from the temple's high priest, he would have threatened to get the shawl. He would have killed the cleric to keep him from talking. Lydia had goosebumps at the mere notion. She told Ash that he didn't need to steal it, because stealing it herself was worth it. Lydia realised that sounded really stupid. Ash told her to go. The nun began to ask Lydia and Ash if they had a successful prayer service. And later, the girl noticed Lydia, who was wearing an Ash jacket, and decided what was to be. The prayer room was chilly. Lydia replied to the nun about how she was actually getting cold before she even got here. The nun replied about how the seasons were just now changing, and afterwards she asked if she could serve them hot tea in the reception hall. Lydia began to play and tell the girl that they had finished praying, so they would drive back. Lydia said her soul was aching to savour the views of the temple longer, but it was beginning to get cold. The nun apologised for not being able to help in any way. Lydia realised that the only thing the nun was sorry about was letting Ash go. The nun said she would escort them to the exit. Lydia started talking about how, honestly, after the girl stole the shawl of enchantment, she wouldn't have the courage to visit the temple again. Ash asked if the shawl was okay. Before she could take it, she fumbled for the offerings. Lydia was supposed to leave them in the prayer room, but forgot. In fact, the jewel of the temple had been stolen and it should have been surprising that in such a situation Lydia would care that she had not left the offerings. And the fact was that if she had left offerings, she would have been able to make some amends to her conscience. Lydia called out to the nun. Lydia said she needed to go back to the prayer room for a minute. The girl told Ash that she would be back quickly and told the guy to wait for her here. The guy offered to go together, but Lydia declined. The girl also remembered to thank the nun Lilia was on her way to the prayer room and praised herself for not finding a conscientious thief like her. After a while, the girl ran into some unknown fellow. He immediately noticed that the girl had dropped a shawl of charms. The guy picked up the shawl and put it around Lydia's neck. The girl looked at this guy carefully. It had gold embroidery on white fabric. It was noticeable at a glance that the clothes were expensive. Lydia had some familiar feeling. The guy looked at Lydia and said that the shawl suited her very well. When he looked at the girl, Lydia recognised him as the crown prince. Dazzling blonde hair that resembled the radiance of the sun. 
green eyes that seem to absorb all the green of the world. The male protagonist of this universe, Agrita's lover, the crown prince of Ligret, who would later ascend to the throne. Lilia had no way of understanding what the guy was doing here. The girl began to tell the prince that she was the youngest mistress of these lands. The boy told Lydia that he had seen her before. The girl was honoured that the prince remembered her. In the original, the crown prince was a man who liked to hang around everywhere. If a girl had the inclination to walk around so much, they would cross paths much more often. Lydia hadn't met anyone special, so she asked her heart to calm down. Lydia replied that it was time for her to get back to her business and wished that God would bless them to meet again, even though they had only just met. The prince began to call out to Lydia. When the girl approached him, the boy couldn't take his eyes off Lydia. Lydia could not understand why he was looking at her like that. The prince began to touch the girl's curls and told her that they were like roses in bloom. Lydia couldn't understand why he was acting this way. Lydia knew that Agrita treated everything in a simple manner without exception. Unlike Lydia who behaved in a formal manner, Lydia was not the kind of person who should receive such compliments from the prince. Back then, the girl had no way of understanding why he was acting like that until she saw the shawl of enchantment. She threw it over her shoulders and forgot about it. Thus, the crown prince turned out to be the first guinea pig. However, Lydia noted that the effect was instantaneous. After all, the shawl is the temple's jewel for a reason. The girl was talking to the prince about how his hair looked like the word rays of a scorching sun. The boy began to ask the girl if she liked them. And then he began to stroke the girl's hair again and said that he liked it very much. It sounded rather narcissistic, but the girl thought his words had a different meaning. The prince was only looking at Lydia's hair. Among the young ladies, the crown prince was nicknamed the Iron Wall. Lydia realised that she might be in trouble. What was astonishing was that this arrogant temple had created a truly frightening thing with its power. Lydia told the guy that she would take his words as a compliment, however, she didn't deserve such an honour. And afterward, Lydia told the prince that she intended to leave the prince first. Lydia hoped the prince would not follow her, but as she left, the girl forgot to leave the offerings. Lydia approached the nun and Ash. The boy began to ask if the sister was finished. A high minister approached the prince and asked what the prince was doing. The high attendant asked the prince if he was lost. The attendant thought he had told the prince that the waiting room was in a different place and he was very surprised to see the prince in his way. The prince apologised and said that it was an inconvenience to him himself. The high servant was glad that the prince himself was aware of his own shortcomings. Perfectly skilled in all the subtleties of diction and gifted with many other talents was Crown Prince Ligret Hayden. In reality, the prince was terribly spatially oriented, absolute topographical cretinism. The problem was quite serious, but somehow few people around him knew about it. As wrong as the ruling of his movement was, no one suspected it, since it seemed to everyone that he was going that way out of his own desire. The High Servant was one of the few who knew the truth. The Prince called out to the High Minister and said that this was truly a temple of love. The attendant couldn't understand what the Prince was talking about, a face with feline features that gave away her conflicting inner feelings. Her hair was the same colour as the roses blooming in the garden. The Prince could not tell if he had ever had such feelings when he met her. There was no way the Prince could forget my Lady Lily Woodgreen. He remembered that they had crossed paths a couple times at balls. However, the prince did not remember being so enraptured by her appearance in those moments. At any rate, the guy thought it was wonderful to meet beautiful people. It had been a long time since the prince had had such a thing. Some guy was telling the prince that he would find love. There was no way the guy could understand that. The guy was saying that probably the prince would meet his fate within this year. The prince didn't understand since when this guy became a fortune teller. The boy replied that when he heard the prediction he did not think much of it, for in the temple of love such words are always spoken. The prince hoped that the prophecy should come true. The attendant looked at the prince and realised that something good had happened to the prince. Mr Gami was sitting in the room, he understood that he had been abandoned by his family. He was afraid that some man would finish him off. Mr. Gami had nothing left, his position, his money, his surroundings, even a part of his body. 
At the ceremony, it was discovered that the gentleman had drugged my lady Widgreen's drink. Guy tried to get away with it by taking a concubine, but it was unsuccessful. Mr Gammy thought he was out of luck. After all the proceedings, he lost his position. Once the Lord was stripped of his noble lineage, Guy was removed from the family tree. But even then, he didn't take the situation seriously. According to the papers, even though the Lord had been removed from the family, he was a blood son, and he believed that parents couldn't banish their own son. It was only a shame that he wouldn't be able to inherit anything, and that didn't mean he would be kicked out of the mansion immediately. In the future, it seemed to the gentleman that he would have no problems as long as they lived quietly and peacefully, but he was promoted out of the house empty-handed. The Lord couldn't understand why this was so. The guy tried to contact them, but he couldn't, and if he went straight to the main gate of the house, he would be chased away like any other of the commoners. That's when the Duke of Widgreen appeared in front of the Lord. Ash asked the Lord with which fingers he took the pills, and if the lad didn't answer, he would cut them all off one by one. The gentleman was very much afraid of this and said he would tell everything. Sir Darbury asked Ash why he had brought him if the lad could do everything himself. Ash told the Lord that if he lived, life would be like hell and after all, it was for his own good. Ash took his sword and started to cut Mr Gammy's legs. Sir Danbury said it was better than cutting his fingers. Sir Darbury was talking about how if he did nothing he would not be happy. Sir so thought about the dirty things he had tried to do to his girl, and wished he could kill Mr Gammy right now. It would be easy to let him live, but he'd have to put up with it. After a while, Mr Gammy lay in his bed and said he was going to be killed. The people who made him like this, and the woman who is responsible for it all. The donations left in the prayer hall were eventually delivered through the priest. At first the priest looked puzzled. Lydia handed it over like a sack of money. It was all Lydia's conscience. Though the girl was a thief, but in any case the girl has a conscience, though the girl overreached. Sir Darbury asked the girl if she had enjoyed her trip to the temple. Lydia replied that her soul was impressed. The girl died after only a half-day carriage ride. Lydia thought she was the only one. After a while, the girl decided to take a bath, have dinner, and she thought about living a little longer. Lydia was very tired. The girl remembered that she met a prince in the temple, and that was also in the book. The beginning of fall is when the weather changes. Lately, the heir to the throne felt a kind of desolation. The prince visits the temple of love to see if he can find the reason for his feelings. He says he will meet his destiny within a year. He heard a prophecy that wasn't a prophecy at all. Later, in a desolate alley, as if by fate, he meets Agrita and remembers the prophecy. Lydia thought her memory was brilliant, and as fate would have it, the prince was in the temple. And exactly why he was in this distant temple of love at a time like this. Lydia thought she was just unlucky, at least in that place at that time, if she met the prince when she had her shawl of enchantment with her. The prince hardly knew Lydia, but he told her that her hair was like roses in full bloom. Lydia was tormented by one question. If the prince was in his right mind then, how could he remember everything? She thought he would remain in a story of suffering in a blanket. This was sad for the girl. Lydia didn't understand why the prince couldn't return her shawl and wrap it around her neck. And she also realized what was most likely more than just kindness, when the prince picked up what had fallen to the floor and after him and wrapped it around her neck. Lydia realized that the prince had a good memory and she wanted to get the blessing of oblivion as soon as possible. Ari opened the door and saw Lydia there. The girl immediately ran up to Lydia and asked her how her trip to the temple went and if everything was okay. Lydia started to pull out something and Ari watched it carefully and then Lydia showed the girl the shawl of enchantment. Ari was shocked by this she started asking Lydia if she could touch it. Lydia allowed her to do so, but only to touch it. Ari asked the girl how she stole it and if it was hard. Lydia answered that she was almost caught like a criminal and she almost didn't guess the password. But so, Lydia didn't say how she stole it. She told Ari that it didn't matter. Ari wondered if it really worked and whoever sees it actually falls in love. After all, this shawl of enchantment looks like an ordinary fabric. Lydia began to say that colour and pattern aside, 
there wasn't even any perceptibly special material in it. And if it wasn't for the prince's sacrifice, Lydia wouldn't have known if the shawl worked or not. The girl asked Ari if she wanted to make sure of that. Lydia threw the shawl over her heart, and Ari looked at her with loving eyes. As soon as Lydia took off the shawl, Ari started saying that she almost proposed to her sister. Ari said it was dazzling, and if she were a man, she would have definitely proposed. And if same-sex marriage was allowed too, women would propose too. Lydia and Ari were curious to know how it worked. Lydia said they could never know, because it was magic. Ari wanted to see her sister, and afterward the girl threw her shawl over herself. Lydia looked at Ari with the same eyes as her. Ari told Lydia about the marriage proposal she was joking about, but it was interesting. Ari didn't know how to put it. Lydia said that when Ari put the shawl on, it was like she had a halo. Lydia's heart began to race, and she wanted to get closer to Ari. Somehow, the girl overcame the urge to win the man's favour. Ari thought that Lydia would give the shawl as a gift to her bride-to-be. Lydia thought about the fact that if she wore such a thing, everyone would call her not a goddess. But afterward, the girl remembered that the crown prince had burned the shawl of enchantment. Lydia thought about what it might have been for Agrita's safety, with the great name of the Temple of Love, which the girl knows because she was a snob. The existence of this absurd treasure is something Lydia is grateful for. Now Ari will use this shawl to get Ash's attention, and then Lydia will be able to escape as she planned. Ari began to tell Lydia that she would now use the shawl of enchantment from this day forward. Lydia agreed with those words. Ari was worried about Lydia and wondered if she was okay. Lydia was afraid for Ari because the girls had seen the effects of the shawl. Ari said that Ash is a villain anyway. Lydia didn't understand where this perfection came from, and maybe it was because the girl was a good thief. Afterward, Lydia asked Ari if she was afraid of Ash. Ari answered that she was afraid of him because he was a villain, and that was exciting for the girl. Lydia knew better than anyone that Ash was a villain. Sometimes when he smiled at the girl, it was hard to take her eyes off him. Come to think of it, Ari hadn't been paying attention to Ash since the beginning. Lydia thought about the fact that it was because Ash was the main male protagonist. Ari agreed with what Lydia said about the guy being very handsome, and it's the first time she's seen someone who looks like that. Ari understood and said there's nothing you can do because the girl's eyes and hair aren't black. Lydia didn't understand what Ari was talking about. The girl was saying that Guy's hair colour and eyes are colourful and she doesn't feel like a human being. In fact, guys like that don't even relate to people. Ari added and said about how it's like looking at a beautiful painting or statue. Lydia said about how even she liked actors with colourful hair in her past life. Ari couldn't figure out where and when to wear her shawl. She decided it was wrong to wear it everywhere and everywhere. Lydia told the girl about thinking right, because it's trash, and if a rumour comes out while Lydia is writing, the girl will be taken to the capital. And if that's the case, Ari will need to use her when she's alone with Ash. Ari was afraid to spend time alone with the villain. She didn't want him to be alone with her, and she would need to help. Ari asked Lydia what the girl was doing tomorrow. Lydia answered Ari that she would be saving the girl's security tomorrow, since Ari needs personal security. Lydia had this idea before. Sadabri is an excellent knight, and for now, he is Lydia's guard, but there are many restrictions to protect Ari. For example, the hostage-taking in the banquet hall. Sadabri abandoned Ari to protect Lydia. In the end, a defenceless Ari was taken hostage. If not for Ash, Lydia would have died once and possibly used the beads. This may happen again in the future. Sir Darbury was doing his duty, so Lydia can't blame him. Also, because Sir Darbury is always around, Ari had to be with Lydia to get help from him. Because trouble comes even early in the morning. Ari had no choice but to get up early and come to Lydia. It wasn't for a day or two, but because she was getting up early, Ari complained of fatigue. Ari slept a lot in the mornings, and if she had personal security, she could sleep longer. Seeing a problem but not solving it was impossible. But finding someone as talented, similar or better than Sir Darbury was possible because he thought it was enough to entrust Ari's protection to the future. But it was not a principled decision. Even after Lydia is gone for good, Ari will need a good guard for her own safety. 
Lydia wondered if there was another solution now that wasn't there before. Of course there was, this shawl of enchantment. Pri asked Lydia if she could really save the guards. Lydia was telling the girl to trust her. The palace holds at least two fencing competitions a year. Flower festival in the spring, harvest festival in the fall. There are other national holiday events, including events tournaments. This means that there are quite a few promising fences in a year Lilia thought about taking one of them to protect Ari. In the morning, the girl sent people to the guild to buy information. Winners in five years. Of all the official fencing tournaments, the sheet had the personal details and whereabouts of those who don't serve anyone yet written on it. Winning a tournament proves their exceptional skills. Of course, families who need talent will try to hire them, but the fact that they haven't joined anyone yet shows their high bar. Among the top four knights, there was one swordswoman. Lydia knew it wouldn't be easy. Sir Darbury decided wanted to describe the whole situation, since such people usually want money or status, because Sir Darbury had not heard of the Shawl of Enchantment, but only knew of this fact. Lydia told the guy that it was fine and she would show him the unusual situation, but she had a way to do it. A noble and proud knight simply cannot break the contract he himself signed. That's why Lydia will use the shawl of enchantment. The girl will just get Ari to sign the contract. It will be like a drug. Among the noblemen, a personal knight servant. Lilia heard that there are many people who cross over into rudeness and nasty things. Compared to them, Ari is just an angel. The girl is kind and sweet, and most likely no guard can resist her, because even guards have a heart. Among the winners on the roster, Linda Ethel was the only female knight, and the girl needed the guards to always be by Ari's side. Lydia thought Ari would be better off with a woman, if possible. Lydia said they should go to Mrs Linda Ethel's house first. Lydia was telling the girl that she would melt her heart with a shawl of enchantment. As Lydia, Theo Darbury and Ari stood next to Lena Ethel, she told the trio that her left arm was injured, and they should have known that if they had come to hire her as a guard. The girl was saying that her injury was serious and she would need time to relearn the sword like she used to. And afterwards, she added that if they still needed her, they should come next year. It was a surprise to everyone. Lydia was very much angry. Sir Darbury was telling the girl that the first pancake is always the first pancake. And afterward, the lad jokingly added and asked Lydia if he would want to speak out before he was turned away again. Lydia told the guy to shut up and not say anything. The girl said there was nothing to be done and next on their list was Sir Brand Villain. Lilia said about how they had three more candidates, so they should be fine. Bran Villain had won two tournaments in a row and had established himself as a talented swordsman. Lydia thought it would be great if he became a guard for Ari and he was only the second one because he was a man. The trio sat at the guy's side. Bran told them that they had to pay 100,000 gold every year to have him work for them. Lydia decided not to refuse at once. He thought it was too much. And even if you were three times rich, it was hard to pay such a sum. The girl said she understood the boy and offered him a seat. In a deserted place, even if you want to, you can't refuse the shawl of enchantment. Lydia wondered how much they'd sign the contract for. Bran said he wouldn't do less than that because that's how much it cost to treat his brother. Lydia asked the guy what kind of treatment he was talking about. Brand replied that his younger brother had a terminal illness and needed the amount to treat him, or he would die. Lilia had no way of understanding where the guy was getting such a dramatic story from. The girl wished the best for Brand's brother and later they left. Sir Darbury told the girl about how they didn't even have half of it left, and the guy was here to meet a better man. The weather began to change. Lydia looked at the sky, where the usual clouds had begun. This weather phenomenon has nothing to do with today. After a while, Lydia thought so. The remaining two were no different. The first one plans to move to meet the family he broke up with as a child, and the second one's fiancé died, so he went to his home year and disappeared. Lydia didn't understand why so many tragic stories had suddenly started, and she couldn't figure out what to do with them. The girl realised that it was possible to use the shawl of enchantment. Regardless of their problems, the shawl would make them sign the contract. But the girl couldn't let go of her humanity. She was faced with a very difficult choice. Ari and Sir offered Lydia a snack. Ari was very hungry while they were here all this time, and the guy offered them to enjoy a delicious lunch. It was soon beginning to be noon. 
The trio came to grab a bite to eat at some cafe, and they were greeted right away. The waitress smiled and said that there was a free seat by the window, and if she would sit there. Trinity said they would choose another seat. Lydia picked a seat and told them to sit there. The girl decided to go inside the restaurant not only to have a snack, but also because it was dangerous for Ari to walk around outside, and the girl would be safer inside than outside. Someone could get in through the window by breaking it, so it was better to sit away from it. Lydia thought about what to order. Trinity ordered, and they decided that was enough. Just as suddenly, someone jumped through the window and broke it. There was a man in the cafe who was hiding his face with a black mask in broad daylight. Lydia thought it was suspicious. She decided to watch this guy as he suddenly started running at them. Lydia knew this would happen. But before she could run, something started happening to the guy and he fell to the floor. Lydia realised that this was the art of invisible light. Sir Darbury said it was the same one. After a while, some guard began to approach the lad. He was very angry and was telling the guy that how dare he run away in front of him, because the guy should know that today is the tournament. Lydia couldn't understand who they were. After a while, the guards came up to the guy and something happened to him. It was like a groan. He probably had something broken. Lydia asked Sir if he knew any of these people. The guard was punching and cursing at the guy. The guard turned out to be a girl and she was a famous swordswoman. Lydia wondered how much of a celebrity this girl was. Sir Darbury told Lydia that the girl was a five-time hidden winner. Hidden is a small village on the edge of the Iranian islands. It can't be found by accident, just by knowing the way. However, about ten years ago, the word came to mean more than a village. Secret swordsman tournaments held in the village arena were left to take bets. Any spectator could either win or lose by betting on the winner. Human-related gambling is illegal, and rumour has it that a noble aristocrat watches these tournaments. Lily has heard that they don't take just anyone for the spectacle, but select professional fighters regardless of their background. Five consecutive victories in a no-holds-barred fight where even murder is allowed. Lilia realised that this was the woman they were looking for. The girl asked where she was from and if she had a contract with any clan. Sir Darbury answered the girl that so far she was earning money in Hidden, but he could not say for sure. After a while, the girl had already run to the swordswoman, Delana. Lydia was very happy to meet the girl. She told the swordswoman that her name was Lydia Widgreen of the Widgreen family. And later the girl asked Delana if she could be distracted for a moment. That guy's swordswoman hit him with a big rock and he fell. Delana would definitely have the power as well, which Delana really needed. The girl told Lydia that she was against it. Delana talked about how she didn't deal with aristocrats. Lydia understood. Hidden participants don't think much of aristocrats. In their eyes, aristocrats are pigs who make bloody spectacles for entertainment. To her, Lydia was just another rich person who doesn't consider her a human being. Maybe in a way it's natural. Lydia had never thought that Delana could treat aristocrats so badly. The girl didn't know what she should do because Dylan was not to be missed. Dylan Mann, who was perfect for Lydia, the girl had outstanding skills, so she was also a woman. An attractive and bold personality, throwing a stone at a thief. Lydia wondered what she should do. There were too many people to use the shawl of enchantment. Lydia realised that she would have to find another place where she and Dylan could be alone. But she didn't know how to do that, because the girl wasn't really in the mood to talk. The waitress was standing there telling people that she was about to call security and they would be here soon. Lydia was standing next to Dylan and talking about security being on their way here. Dylan's face changed. Lydia didn't understand what it was about and asked the girl if she did the right thing to chase the guy down and catch him. Dylan said it didn't matter. Lydia was telling the girl that it was a big deal to her. Lydia was saying that he might be a thief, but the girl didn't see any proof. Dylan didn't understand what the girl was talking about. Lydia was talking about how the girl had now turned this guy into chops in front of a lot of people. And if the guy says he didn't steal anything, but was beaten up like that. Lydia asked Dylan how she would refute such words. After all, it's obvious that the guy is empty-handed, and apparently he got away faster than he stole something. However, it seems that this guy heard everything. Lilia was telling the girl that there are a lot of witnesses in that cafe who will say that Dylan beat him up, 
and Dylan's only argument is only that this guy is a thief. Dylan asked Lydia what she was getting at. The girl said she could give Dylan her statement. Lydia could talk about how the man wanted to attack her, but Dylan was the only one who stopped and reacted to it. Lydia told the girl that if she testified, even without proof that he was a thief, Dylan's actions would be justified. After all, there was no evidence that he wanted to attack, but that would be enough for the police. Lilia asked the girl if she liked it, and also added that she wouldn't ask for much. Lilia said she needed to get some privacy in a quiet place, and it was much better than being arrested for assault. Dylan asked Lilia if five minutes would be enough for her. The girl nodded her head, handing the thief over to the police, giving a statement, and then it was time to get to lunch then went to Dylan's house so Lydia could talk. Dylan told the girl that she agreed to this, not only because the offer was good for her, but also because Ari seemed nice to her. Dylan talked about how she liked beautiful people. Lilia was very happy about that and thanked the girl. Lilia and Dylan went to the swordswoman's house. Lilia was a little embarrassed, but she realized that if Dylan liked beautiful people, she should like Ari for sure. Lydia sat on the chair and waited for Ari and Dylan to talk. Sadabri looked at Lydia and saw contentment in her eyes. Lydia asked Sadabri for his opinion and if they could make it work. The lad replied about how although the girl had done a lot on her own, it was more important for Lydia to give Mrs Grace a chance to show herself. Lydia was confident that everything had gone perfectly. Sadabri was surprised at the girl's faith. Lydia asked the lad for his opinion and told him if he thought things were going too well. Sadabri asked the girl if she knew why Dylan was famous. Lydia said that the girl had won five in a row at Hidden. So replied that wasn't all. Dylan had broken the wrist of the scion of an aristocrat who had taunted her. The rumour spread very quickly and everyone knew about it. Lydia was in great shock at such information. It had been several years since Sir Darbury had heard the story, but he still remembered it. Lydia didn't understand how the girl could get away with it. Sir said she was very lucky. The witness was another aristocrat who had a score to settle with the injured man. He said that the injured man had tripped and fallen during the whiteout and there were no other witnesses. Lydia asked the fellow if the aristocracy had no special rights in such cases. The guy replied that there was a training ticket that said that an aristocrat had the right to kill on the spot, without trial, a commoner who wounded him, and the knights couldn't even hurt her with the tip of a blade. Lydia realised that a public condemnation was not possible because of witnesses and physical retribution was not a possibility. Lydia realised that Dylan was really strong and the girl really liked her. Lydia asked the guy if this story was over. Sir Darby replied that she broke an aristocrat's wrist, a man from a different stratum of society. The guy was afraid for Ari so she wouldn't do anything to her. Lydia talked about how this man who was hurt by Dylan was taunting her. Ari definitely wouldn't do that. So the girl reassured Sadabri and talked about how everything would be okay. Sadabri replied that sisters and brothers stay close to each other anyway. Lydia didn't hear the guy and asked him what he said, but the guy didn't want to say anything anymore. The guy was surprised that Lydia wasn't bothered at all by such a conversation. For knowing that Ari would be alone with Dylan, Lydia had said nothing, for the lad was afraid that the swordswoman might harm her. The girl laughed for she knew that Sir Darby had made up this whole story to scare the girl. After a while, Ari came out and was saying she made it. Dylan didn't realise what she had done. Lilia started asking what they had come to. Ari talked about how they had only made a verbal agreement at first, and then they would sign a formal contract. Ari told Lydia that Dylan would start accompanying her today. Lydia wasn't sure about the water of the verbal contract. Dylan heard the whole conversation and said that she always keeps her word, and now that the contract is finalised, she is responsible for Ari's safety. Dylan also added that if she pays, she can have her head chopped off. Lily was glad she was more reliable than the girl thought, and they weren't going to cut off the head yet. Dylan knew Sir Darby and told him they hadn't seen him in a while and later called him lucky. Lydia and Ari watched it all and were shocked that they knew each other. Ari talked about Sir Darby knowing a lot about Dylan from their conversations. Dylan was telling the guy that she had heard he was doing well and now she could see for herself. The guy told Dylan that she looked good too. Lydia asked the two if they knew each other. Sir Darby told the girl that he and Dylan had crossed paths in the past. 
Lydia asked Dylan why she acted like she knew him well. The girl said that she had been reluctant to speak to a traitor who had joined the aristocrats, but now she was the same. Dylan then extended her hand to Sir Darbury and told him it was a pleasure to meet him. The boy made the same gesture. Lydia and Ari were shocked by this and asked afterward if they had been rivals in the past. Dylan said their destinies were closely linked. Then the girl was taller than the guy and now the ugly duckling has overpowered Dylan. Sir Darbury talked to the girl about having ears and Dylan needs to choose her words properly. The girl called the boy too right. Dylan was telling the guy that she had no pleasure in teasing him now. Lydia saw that in words they were enemies, but in practice they were perfect for each other. The girl did not know what the future held for them. It began to rain, the clouds began to thicken, but it was not heavy. Lydia looked at the rain and realised that it was not going to end. Usually you can't be wrong about this kind of thing. After a while, everyone arrived. Lydia knew it was going to rain. Ari looked at the rain and realised that it was pouring down like a bucket. Sir Darbury took off his jacket and told Lydia to hide like under an umbrella. The girl thanked the lad. Ash was standing outside the palace in the rain. Lydia yelled to Ash that they were having a heavy rain. If you looked closely, Ash wasn't even soaked. Something transparent was covering him. It was like magic. Lydia walked up to Ash and asked why he was out. Ash replied that he came out because it suddenly started raining. Ash told Lydia that he realised that she had forgotten her umbrella, so he decided to meet a girl. Lydia asked Ash how he knew when the girl was coming. The guy talked about how he asked her to warn him when the carriage would appear on the horizon and afterward told her to go. The others stood and looked at Ash and Lydia. They were all wet. Ash made an invisible bubble with a quick snap of his fingers that contained all the people. Lydia held onto Ash's hand and thought about something. The heavy rain stopped after a while and the soggy ground had dried up by the next day. Dylan stayed at the mansion for a few days as Ari's chaperone. Soon they became friends with the girl and Ari started addressing Dylan informally because it was easier for Dylan that way. Lily expected it. Dylan is Ari's bodyguard and she lives with them for now. Ash didn't react in any way to Dylan the girl brought. He was so indifferent that he seemed but aware of Dylan's presence at all. When Lydia introduced Dylan, Esh just looked up and suddenly Alex reacted the most and called her a night girl. Then Dylan jumped on Alex and told him to just try and repeat those words. She didn't like that the guy called her a female knight. Lydia didn't know what Delana was going through just because she was a woman. So when Delana jumped on the guy, there was nothing Lydia could do to help the guy. Alex had simplicity in his features. It was a very good trait. But in this world, it was important to be perceptive. After that, Lydia had to comfort the guy. Dylan got the room next door to Ari's. It wasn't long before the girl got used to living in the mansion and was quick to react to any danger to Ari. You couldn't really call it getting used to it. Once last night, twice this morning. Three times already Dylan had saved Ari from death. Why so often? Ari said she was very unlucky. Considering how easily the girl agreed with that, Dylan wasn't very bright, but later it convinced the girl. Thinking more broadly, it really is all about bad luck. And yet Dylan is doing better than expected. Her skills Lydia would give her a 15 out of 10 and her insight a 16. Lydia was glad that Ari would be safe without Sir Darbury, but the main problem was still unresolved and would not be dealt with so easily. But Lily had done her best and now she could think about her own problems. Today is a very important day for Lydia. That's right, a very important day. Today is the day the girl uses the shawl of enchantment on Ash. Everything has been planned out. Place. The fountain in the garden in front of the mansion. Time, 10 p.m. If Ari goes out first with the charm shawl, Lydia will go to the fountain with Ash, and they would meet by chance. It sounded simple enough in Lydia's head, but still, why did the girl choose such a place and time? Because it's romantic. If the girl uses the shawl of enchantment, then she would need to choose the right place. At night, the garden creates a special atmosphere, and the fountain will complete the picture. It won't be the usual cliché where the main characters meet under the moonlight in the park. Lilia was glad that the rain had ended, because if it had not stopped, the mud would have made the setting seem less inviting. The girl stood in the street and had a strange feeling that was very hard for her to describe. The feeling was like looking out the window and not seeing the scenery. 
and something clenched in her chest. And that feeling had not let go of the girl since the moment they decided to apply the shawl. It was neither anticipation nor patience. It wasn't something good, but as if it was the opposite. Lydia thought about the fact that maybe she was worried, but then calmed herself down and realised that it couldn't be, for her plan was perfect and she had nothing to worry about. It was reliable, because it relied on the shawl of enchantment, especially the effect of the shawl had already been tested. But the feeling wouldn't leave the girl. Lilia thought about it and didn't realise what it was, and then decided it could all be because of the butler's grumbling, and decided that it might well be. For in the morning the butler appeared and said that he had heard how Lilia had met Dylan, and that he was very unhappy with the girl's action, for Lilia had been too rash, and she might have been hurt. Failing the girl he famously. Having started the morning with a devilish sermon, Lilia thought of only one thing. Namely, who had told it all, and Lilia realised that Sir Darbury was involved in the whole affair. Lilia vowed to take revenge on him by all means, but it wouldn't be easy. That was the reason for the girl's excitement. Just the after-effects of the blow to the psyche right after the dream. But the girl had made up her mind that Sir Darbury needed revenge, but she didn't know how to do it. Lydia was sitting in her room, and Ari started knocking on her door. Lydia answered the girl that the door was open, and she could enter it. Ari ran into the room very quickly. Lydia had no way of knowing what was going on. Ari called out to the girl and said she had something interesting to show her. The girl replied to Lydia that it was almost as interesting as watching a fire. There was a duel outside. In the duel, Lydia saw Dylan. Sir Darbury talked about how, yesterday, someone saw Dylan save Mistress Grace in the night, and then that person was impressed and wanted to test her skills. And duelling is perfect for skills. Lydia asked Ari if that was true, and the duel was won again by Dylan. Without a chance, the girl won again. Lydia saw how Ari had become very attached to Dylan. Lydia asked the girl about calling Ari out just to show off. The girl said it was too obvious. Sir Darbury talked about how you can't beat talent. The only ones left in the ring were those who couldn't win. All the worthy knights of the mansion were now on their quests, and the remaining ones were no match for Dylan, except for one man. Lilia raised her hand and said there was a third volunteer. It was Sir Darbury. Afterward, the girl pushed the boy over to Dylan. Everyone was very happy that Sir Darbury wanted to participate. Someone in the crowd was saying that it was going to be a very interesting duel. Dylan told the guy that they hadn't crossed blades with the guy in a long time, and it was time to fix that. Sir Darbury didn't understand why Lydia was doing this to him. It was revenge for tattling. Everyone in the crowd laughed, for the mistress was on Dylan's side. The boy decided there was nothing to be done in this situation, and he had to go. The duel was starting. No one knew if Dylan would win now. Ari asked Lydia if the girl wanted Dylan to win. The girl replied to Ari that she didn't care who won. The girl wanted Darbury to be commissioned, and the result of this battle was for Darbury. Sir Darbury asked Lydia if she was being too frank. Lydia noticed that the lad didn't even break a sweat, and the victory was given to him too quickly. At first he only parried Dylan's swift attack, and when they crossed blades, Sir Darbury took advantage of the moment when Dylan lost her balance. She immediately regained control and was about to counter-attack, but Darbury was faster. They were both good and fun to watch but Lydia wished Darbury had been hit in the face at least once, because she had hoped he would have gotten it right. Sap Darbury talked to Dylan about her skills getting better. The girl told the lad that his stupidity was unchanged. Sir Darbury replied that it would be strange if it were the other way around. Lydia remarked that their relationship was a good one. Dylan spoke to the lad about how far he had come, and asked him if it was all to the young gentleman's credit. Sir Darbury spoke of not knowing what it was all about. Lydia said that judging by Darbury's reaction, it was a very funny story. Lydia began to ask Dylan what she was talking about. The girl was surprised that Lydia didn't know about it, because this story was about how Darbury got into that mansion. Dylan told the girl that it was something to see. Sir Darbury didn't let the girl finish. Lydia realised that there seemed to be many stories that the girl didn't know about. Sir Darbury was talking to Dylan about how, since they had finally met, would just one fight be enough. The guy talked about how if Dylan wants to run away by tucking her tail, that's fine. The girl was very angry with the guy, 
and shouted at him to defend himself. Lydia thought it was for the best, because she wanted Darbury to get punched in the face. His Excellency, it was about Ash. Darbury came to the mansion five years ago, before Ash was a young master. Back then, he went out on business with the adults and came back picking up Darbury. The girl was just quoting Ash. Had something happened in the process of getting Darbury? Not that Lydia was interested, but there seemed to be some very interesting story behind it. Lydia could have asked Ari to ask Dylan, but the girl decided it was time to call it a day. And if it was about Darbury, then let him tell her himself. If the girl didn't find out, then no big deal. It was 10pm on the clock and it was time. Lydia calmed herself down. Ari had already gone to the fountain in the garden. Ash had just recently left the study and went to his room. It wasn't bedtime yet, and so it was clear that he was probably awake. Lydia only had to bring him in. The girl wanted to knock on Ash's door, as suddenly a guy stood behind the girl asking what was wrong. Lydia asked Ash if he wanted to go for a walk. The girl said that it was so cool and very nice right now. There was no logic in the girl's words, but what can you do? Ash immediately agreed to such a strange proposal. Lydia was surprised that the guy wasn't embarrassed by anything. The girl wondered if it had ever happened that Ash had gotten lost in front of someone. Lydia realised that this was something she would never see because she would run away. The girl felt like something clenched in her chest again. Lydia realised that it was still the effects of the grunts. Lydia thought she didn't feel good or she was worrying too much. Ash grabbed the girl's hand and they started to walk down the stairs. The guy clearly had another reason and nothing came to mind for him to hold Lydia so tightly. The girl looked up at the sky. It was a nice cool evening. It had already gotten dark, but thanks to the moon, everything was visible. It was the perfect time to apply the shawl. It was a beautiful night, but something was still wrong. Lydia thinks that all soon she and Ash will go to the fountain, but she does not understand why it is so hard for her to go. Suddenly Ash chuckles, which scares the girl. She wonders why her brother was laughing, to which he replied that he was just remembering his childhood. They used to play hide-and-seek when he was very young, didn't they? Lydia comes in shock that Ash still remembers this. She thinks Ash was about four years old when they played hide-and-seek. Ash responds positively. He remembers climbing up a tree to hide and so Lydia fell out of the tree. Lydia thinks it's her dark past. She remembers everything. It happened when Ash was four and she was eight. Even though they were small, she remembered her past life. So psychologically, she was 20. She doesn't understand what she was thinking then, as a 20-year-old, when she decided to catch her four-year-old brother and climbed a tree after him. At the time, Lydia thought that since he climbed, so could she. Then she realised one thing. There was Ash, who at four years old could climb trees with ease, and there was her eight-year-old self, who had not passed on a single bit of monkey genes. As expected, Lydia then fell, which made her very ashamed. Psychologically, a 20-year-old chased a four-year-old child, and now she is so ashamed that she doesn't get up, denying reality. She was so ashamed then that she felt no pain. Lydia returns to reality. She thinks that she didn't cry that day. She was too embarrassed and heavy and thought that if she cried, it would definitely be the end. But then, that day, there was someone who did cry. That day, Ash pushed her fallen sister, asking if she was dead. She was so ashamed that if she could have died, she would have. When Lydia opened her eyes, she saw that Ash was in tears. She immediately rushed to wipe them away with her sleeve. Ash replies that he thought Lydia was dead then, so he cried bitterly. That's when Lydia first saw Ash crying. Ash, with a smile on his face, once again reports that he remembers everything. Unbidden, Lydia grabs Ash by his jacket and notices that her heart is beating hard. Ash calls out to her, and she immediately lets go of the jacket. Lydia informs him that she'll probably be on her way. There's a fountain farther away, and surely Ari is waiting for him behind it. Lydia realises that it looks like she won't be able to go. Ash suggests that Lydia go together, but she turns away and asks if he'll go to the fountain. She says she left something in it, and it's very important to her. Ash will see it right away. Ash replies that he understands and tells his sister to be careful that she doesn't trip. The couple splits up. Ash goes to the fountain and Lydia goes inside the manor. Lydia quickly runs past the butler, causing him to go into shock. She makes it to her room and stands by the door. Looking at her hands, she begins to cry. 
Last night, Lydia cried under the covers, not knowing why. She continued until she fell asleep in the morning. She didn't know why she was crying so hard. She thought she was sick. Lydia wondered if there were people who cried just like that, or if she was the only one. Her eyes were burning, and she needed to look in the mirror. The girl was afraid to imagine who would be there, looked in the mirror, and could not recognize her eyes. Later, a maid came to the girl, and as soon as she looked at Lydia, she was very frightened. Lydia didn't think it would be so bad there. The maid said she would bring ice quickly now. Lydia realized that her eyes were really bad. The girl's whole face was swollen, but that was not to be expected. The maid brought ice and asked Lydia why her eyes were so swollen, and asked the girl if something had happened. Lydia replied that she'd had a sad dream. The maid spoke of lighting incense in the room on such an occasion, for she had heard that it was good for sleep. Lydia thanked the girl, but no sooner had the maid gone than he stopped and told Lydia that she had something to deliver from the master. It was a shawl of charms. Lydia was shocked by this and had no way of knowing why she was here. No matter how you look at it, it was definitely a shawl of enchantment. Lydia asked the maid again if Ash had asked her to give it to her. The girl replied to Lydia that Ash had given it to her last night. Ash said that Lydia had left it somewhere and asked her to give it to him, but Lydia was already asleep at the time. Lydia had no way of knowing where she had left it and if it was at the fountain. Lydia had left something at the fountain last night, but that was the usual excuse, and the shawl was definitely at Ari's yesterday. Lydia couldn't understand why she had the shawl again, so she decided to ask Ari about it later. After a while, Lydia came out. The girl was met by the butler. He was glad that the girl came out and told Lydia that he had something to say. Lydia told the butler if it was definitely necessary. The man said a firm yes. The butler said that perhaps his old man's eyesight was deteriorating. Lydia said she ran like a mouse and no one saw anything last night. Later, the butler left the girl alone. Lydia had her freedom. The girl talked about how, if grumbling was a talent, it was definitely from the devil. Later, Lydia came to Ari and Dylan's house. The girl wished them a good morning. There was a fluorescent coloured spider on Ari's carpet. The girl realised that apparently not everyone was so calm today either. Lydia asked Ari to leave them alone with Ari. As soon as Dylan left the room, Ari started yelling about the charm shawl breaking. Lydia didn't understand what was going on. Ari talked about how she wanted to tell her about it this morning, that the effect was gone. Ari talked about waiting patiently at the fountain yesterday. The shawl was on her. Then the villain showed up. Ari thought Ash would come with Lydia, but he was alone. The girl, as planned, pretended the meeting was accidental. Ash noticed the girl wearing a shawl. He began to tell Ari that it was his sister's. The boy looked at the shawl and said nothing. Ari was confused and said he borrowed it from Lydia for a while. Ash asked the girl to give it back and Ari had to take it off and give it to the guy. Ari gave it back, and Ash left right away. Lydia couldn't figure out what was going on, but Ari said there was more to it. Ari told Lydia to listen to her. She talked about how Ash was talking to her, but he looked at her like she was nothing, like Ari wasn't a person but a mannequin. Ari talked about how the shawl had no effect, and the villain has no interest in Ari. Lydia didn't understand why the shawl wasn't working, she thought it was delusional, and it couldn't be. Ari couldn't understand why it didn't work. The girl was close to the fountain, but she didn't drop the shawl into the water, much less step on it. Ari asked Lydia if she was okay, and if she was all right. Lydia was sorry that the shawl wasn't working. Ari tried to reassure Lydia, and told her that everything would be okay. Lydia said that wasn't the case at all. As Lydia listened to Ari, for a moment the girl was relieved and that relief scared the girl. Lydia's mum didn't understand what she was saying and what relief she was talking nonsense about. The feeling was pure despair. Lydia talked about how there was something wrong with her head, so she was trying in her emotions, but also the girl added that one defeat is not a loss. Lydia didn't understand how the shawl could not work and decided to check something out. She took the shawl from Ari's hands and threw it over herself. Ari stared at the girl as if mesmerised, Lydia couldn't understand what had happened and decided to check again. Ari told the girl that she didn't know why the shawl didn't work, but she believed that it could be different now. And after all, God loves a trinity. 
And this time it will have to be said that it was Lydia who gave Ari the shawl, or else the girl was really scared then. And also Pre suggested to just cover the shawl of enchantment with another one. Lydia told the girl that it would be better that way. All day long Lydia thought about why she had run away from the garden so abruptly and what had caused her to cry. When there were no other reasons left, the girl concluded that her escape was trivial jealousy. But it wasn't that strange jealousy. It was a different kind of jealousy. When a friend or family member shows interest in someone, Lydia starts to feel sad. The girl pretended to be a host, suffering from separation, so she couldn't look at Ari and Ash's meeting. Lydia realised that she was, and also the girl was glad that she finally understood the reason for it all, and decided it was time for her to get rid of the sadness, because her tears were sadness too. And it was that night that the girl just got sad. Any way you look at it, Lydia had reasons to be sad. Because of the stalker last night, the girl had died at 21, and this night she would die at 22 and be killed by her psychopathic brother. So the girl understood how she could not cry, because anyone would cry here. So the girl's reaction was natural. That's why Lydia was drawing conclusions about it. Lydia was able to explain her escape and tears, and now everything was clear to her. However, Ari still didn't know how they should be. She felt like it wasn't going to work out. Ari said that they should try a few times, and by doing so, the girl aroused her excitement. After that, she tried to get close to Ash, sneaked over to Ash to ask him something, accidentally met Ash on her way to the warehouse or office, randomly met him alone in the dining room, and all the while wearing a shawl of enchantment, and flashed Ari in front of Ash as often as she could. Ash was very angry about it, and told the girl that if she ever got caught again, she wouldn't be able to walk. Ari was afraid Ash would kill her, but Lydia said it was a joke and Ash was just kidding. Well, there was nothing good to come from life either. If this were a teen romance where the characters flirt and fall in love, then instead of ignoring it, mutual dislike would have been a better fit, but their genre thriller, unpleasantly psychotic, will lead to death or worse. If Ari started getting threats from Ash, then we'll have to face reality. It's that the shawl of enchantment doesn't work on Ash, and it can't just be explained away. Ari apologised to Lydia. The girl told Lydia that Ari didn't help the girl in any way. Lydia told her not to think about it. The girl didn't know what to do. Charm shawl works on everyone except Ash. Lydia couldn't even think of such a thing. The girl couldn't understand how this could happen. And Lydia didn't understand why she stole the charm shawl in that case. Lydia longed to see the Lord. He was calling her to him. The girl told the Lord that he had better show up or it would be bad. The maid went into Ari and Lydia and told the girls that a letter had come to Lydia's name. The girl couldn't understand where it came from. It was an invitation from the palace. It was a luxurious letter stamped with the royal family's seal and it was an invitation to a dinner party. Lily didn't know why the invitation came personally in her name only but the girl decided that she should go out. So without thinking, Lily got into the carriage. Ash was usually hard to lure to such events, and Ari, for security reasons, stayed at the mansion. Lilia wasn't particularly fond of such evenings either, but right now anything would do for the girl to relax. In the end, the plan with the shawl failed, and all the agony was in vain. But Lydia was glad they had Dylan. Even though stealing the shawl of enchantment wasn't so pointless, it was still depressing. A short time later, the girl was already there. Lily had told Sir Darbury they were a little early. The boy offered to go inside first. The man blocked Lydia and Sir Darbury's path and said he was a personal armed guard and said they couldn't go into the reception hall and whether they should be escorted in. When you think of it that way, only members of the Royal Guard could enter the reception hall, not personal guards. 